Okay, I'd like to go ahead and call this meeting to order the March 19th, 2024 school board work session. Ms. Cadell, can you please take roll? Yes, Dr. Anderson. I'm sorry, Mr. Anderson? Here. Mr. Gould? Here. Ms. Henderson is on here. Ms. Murphy? Here. Ms. Ortiz? Here. Ms. Silverman? Here. And Ms. Tice? Here. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cadell. Can we all please stand for the pledge? Thank you. I'd like to seek a motion for adoption of the agenda 1.04. Thanks, David. I move to adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you, David. Do I have a second? Jared, thank you. All in favor say yes. yes. Any opposed say no. All right, motion passes. All right, we've got some exciting uh, lineup this tonight. We're going to be talking about buses and food and, uh, and, and food. We all have uh, some very exciting uh, cookies in front of us from, uh, from the food services. We appreciate that. We don't have any matchbox cars from transportation, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're looking forward to some good discussions as well, and as well as uh, um, the uh, parents as coaches policy. So we're going to go ahead and start off with 2.01 transportation bus infrastructure. Dr. Noonan, do we turn this over to you? Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, and good evening, everybody. Uh, we've got a full house tonight, and it is a pleasure to welcome Regina Anderson and Richard Kane uh, tonight to talk about transportation and food services, respectively. Um, to be fair, we did look into squeezy buses, the little yellow squeezy buses and we couldn't get them here in time um, so maybe next time we'll, we'll look at some squeezy buses um, but anytime you want to ride on an electric bus you just let us know and we'll be happy to take you around but um, tonight um, at the request of the board um, sometime back you all had asked to, to hear a little bit about um, transportation and a little bit about food services uh, and this evening we have an opportunity um, to have our two experts here to talk about the work that they do um, we are very proud of both our transportation and our food services offices um, and know that sometimes they come under fire in the first two weeks of school but they always uh, seem to sort it out brilliantly uh, and things start to run smoothly in transportation and our food service lines pick up and and everything sort of sorts out but uh, tonight I'll turn it over to uh, Kristen Michael and to Regina Anderson uh, to begin the presentation with transportation so thanks so much thank you chair Tice vice chair Thank you, Chair Gould and Vice Chair sure. Tice. <laughs> Sorry for that. Um, just thank you so much for the opportunity this evening to highlight some of our operational directors. Um, they really are, right, the engine that, that drives the school division in terms of the things that happen kind of day in and day out. So I'm very pleased to give them both an opportunity this evening um, to share a little bit about their departments. So welcome, Regina. Hi, good evening, everybody. Um, Chairman, Vice Chair, esteemed board members and guests. I am Regina Anderson, um, and I've been in the transportation industry for 28 years now. I started in Fairfax County, Virginia, uh, moved up the ranks there to an assistant coordinator position. Uh, then I moved to Colorado and worked for Denver Public Schools for two years. Then I uh, received a position with Fountain Fort Carson School District 8 as their transportation director. And I'm back again <laughs> to Virginia. So that's just a little bit about uh, me and where all I have been. So I've been in the industry for quite some time and I've seen a lot of changes. Uh, but to just to jump into what we're here for today, what are our buses used for? Well, first and foremost, our school buses are used for our everyday to and from transportation uh, to school. So we start off with the Arlington Career Center bus. Then we have three buses that do Jesse Thackeray Preschool. All of our buses come together to do the secondary portion except for the ACC bus. And then they split again to do Mount Daniel and Oak Street. Okay, after that we have late buses. So we have four late buses dedicated to the secondary program to take the students home after their activities at school. And of course we service field trips throughout the day and we do athletics. So that's basically the brunt of what we do and what they're used for. So just to talk a little bit about our transportation staff, um, we are staffed by the director, myself. I have a coordinator, Ms. Don Mills, and we have one part-time office administrator. I have 16 bus drivers for the regular school bus runs. I have two substitute drivers, 10 aides, 
and eight car drivers. And if you notice, our car drivers take some of our outplay students to different locations. They go as far as Rockville, Manassas, Leesburg. So they're out on the road quite a bit, transporting students safely every day. I know a lot of times we don't mention them much because they're a really great crew and they're out there taking care of our kids. So I just wanted to give them kudos. So our transportation staff is composed mostly of part-time employees who work a split shift. We have shared employees. Richard and I have shared employees. So after they finish with me in the morning, they go over to food service and work, and then they come back to me in the afternoon. So we've successfully managed to keep them, you know, gainfully employed and working. And I think they're pretty happy with the outcome of that. They're very good employees, rarely ever miss a day of work. So we're very pleased to have them on board with us. Um, of course, due to our size, we're a very small district. So it's kind of hard to compete with larger districts when we're looking for help. Uh, we are always looking for somebody to help sub so we can cover more sports activities. Um, and right now it's kind of difficult to do just because of the competition in surrounding areas. However, we're doing pretty good, I think, with the recruitment of bus drivers. So I will be interviewing tomorrow just for your information. And um, it's looking pretty good. So I'll keep you all posted on that end. All right, to talk a little bit about our fleet. Currently, we have 23 buses in our fleet. And as I said, 17 of those buses are used for daily runs. Six of them are spares. Out of that six, we have two that are kind of out of commission right now. Uh, one is down for repair, and the other one we're kind of have hanging around in order to uh, turn that in if we get approved for our grant. Well, plus we have the Don Buyer grant, so we're going to have to exchange <coughs> one out and um, demolish it, cut it down, in uh, order to receive the grant bus. And we have, I have uh, put in an application for two more electric buses in, with a grant. And if we are approved for that, we'll find out sometime in April if we got approved for that. We can opt to take the grant or not. And if we do take it, then we'll have to turn in two more of our older buses uh, in order to get those um, electric buses. Okay. And the bus that we have that's slated to come in April, it's an electric bus and it has a wheelchair lift. So I'm really excited about that. So that'll be a big plus. Now with our athletic trips, typically our athletic trips are the longest ones that we have. Um, the number of buses we use for athletics at one time could be about three buses, sometimes a little bit more. So we try to keep one bus as a spare in case one of those other buses breaks down. Um, on average, our athletics go a longer distance, so therefore it's hard for us to use an electric bus to uh, take those students on the trips because right now there's just not the charging infrastructure available at other schools and facilities that are far away. So that's one thing I'm hoping will change in the future and we can really get more use out of our electric buses. Some good news is that we are currently collaborating with the general government. Um, they had a little small uh, activity bus that they've given to us to repurpose and we will be using it for some of our a um, activities and also for some of the smaller athletic groups so we're really excited about that because that will help us to be able to provide more services they also have purchased a shuttle bus um, so we also will be able to utilize that shuttle bus when they have downtime which is usually throughout the school year uh, for other special activity runs and to take team members to other locations. Now, in order to drive one of these buses, you don't have to have a CDL, but you do have to go through training and you will have to have um, a passenger and a school bus endorsement on your license to drive a bus that size now, if you're driving students, okay? So we're really thrilled about um, our joint venture and I'm hoping that we can have some of the coaches with the small teams go and get those endorsements because then they could drive their students um, to their activity, activities. So we're really happy to be partnered with them. All right now, as we all know, school buses age, just like we all do. Um, so assuming that 
We currently have 23 buses with one more on order. That'll be 24 buses in total. Uh, we are currently using a 12-year recycling program where we would purchase two buses each year. There's a little snafu because in previous years we've purchased as many as four buses and sometimes no buses. So that's kind of thrown our replacement schedule off kilter. So for bus uses, for buses that are not replaced solely based on age, oh, our buses are not replaced solely based on age, I'm sorry. Um, sometimes some of our older buses really outperform some of our newer buses. And we've used several different vendors along the way, so some of our buses could be Bluebird buses, some could be Thomas, and everybody has their preference. Uh, right now, we prefer <coughs> Thomas buses for our district, and it's good to align your buses to all be the same. It helps with your mechanics and their repairs, um, and it makes it seamless for your drivers when they have to get on a different bus to drive it, they're familiar. Okay, so we do try to keep that the same. If you look at the chart, if you can see the chart, you can see some of the anticipated deliveries that we have. And as I said, um, school board has graciously allowed us to order um, an electric school bus and a diesel bus. We're very excited about that. It is a year out before we'll receive them, um, but still it's something great to plan for. And always, and that'll be another diesel bus we can add for those longer uh, field trips. So we're very excited about that as well. Some of our older buses have the lower maintenance costs, as I said. Um, so it's kind of hard when we're looking at what buses that we want to replace with some of those grant initiatives, because sometimes you want to get some of those newer lemons out of the system. But I think we're doing pretty good right now. Um, for the most part, most of our buses are starting every day. We're getting on the road and the kids are safe. And that's the main thing, okay? And going back to the electric grant from Don Beyer, as I said, we are speculating on receiving that sometime in April. Uh, so we'll work hard to get it on the road as soon as possible. There are other things we'll have to take care of, like the cameras that go on those lovely buses that generate a lot of the monies for um, our joint efforts. So we'll work with um, two other buses on order and we're likely to keep our other non-working buses, just like I said before, so we can exchange them in that process, okay? Um, we will find out again, like I said, I'm repeating myself, but finding out again if we will be approved for that grant. If we are, it looks like we will receive $200,000 to use for each bus purchase. So that's a significant amount considering that electric bu school buses cost over $400,000. So we're almost halfway there with that grant money. So there's two different ways that we can purchase school buses. One of the ways that we can purchase them is just straight out buying it. The other way is with the lease purchase. They both have their pros and cons. Um, I always thought, wow, it's great just if you could put the money down, let's bring it home. But some, Kristen has informed me, she's a finance person, that sometimes it's good to look at the lease option. However, you have to think about the interest rate when you're doing that. So that's why we have to kind of weigh, how do we want to purchase these buses? Okay. And the lease periodically is a five-year lease when you do the lease option. And as I stated before, we do, uh, electric buses do cost around $402,000 at this time. A diesel bus is $147,000. So you can see there's a great difference, but the price of clean air, well, that's, you can't put a price on that. We need that clean air. So um, I think it's ventures that we all want to see happen for our district. Um, we have a recurring amount of money that's added to our budget of $94,567 that we could use to help purchase some of these buses for us. So we're looking forward to utilizing all the funds that we can in order to continue to have safe buses on the road. Now, now you're looking at our desired bus replacement cycle. So on this uh, 
on this chart, you'll see all the years of the buses that we have. At the very bottom, it's uh, 2025, and those are the ones that we just um, uh, purchased for the diesel and the electric. So they're scheduled to be in 2025. So if you look at that chart, we'll start our countdown with all of that. So you'll see a minus one because we're not expecting to get them until next year. And then we just got um, our 2024 will be coming in in April. And as you see, you can go up the scale and see where we're at as far as having to do a replacement on buses. So it's kind of unbalanced, but I think that with us purchasing, trying to get back on track, purchasing a couple of buses each year and with grant monies, and we've uh, been able to step up getting rid of some of the buses that need to be gotten rid of. And also we can take some buses that are old and outdated out of our spare bus pool and we pre replace them with um, better running buses. So we're looking forward to doing that. And we try to make sure that we maintain four diesel buses of varying ages so that we can use those buses to go out of town on our athletic trips. So that's why it's good to try to infuse our bus purchases with a diesel bus every few years just to keep that cycle going where we have the buses that are road ready to take our students um, pretty far down the road. So if any of you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Mr. Anderson. Really appreciate the, uh, the information and the background on, on how buses are purchased. I mean, it's enlightening to even know that some of the decisions that we made about approving the buses will not happen for another year. Um, so that, that's, that's interesting for, for all of us to know. Um, just a couple questions, and I'll open up also to the board. There was a slide that you had about um, not for the grant, I think. I think it was um, non-prioritized school districts, and you said FCCPS was one. Can you describe what that, that meant, Ms. Michael? The EPA grant parameters had a number of things where they were prioritizing providing bus funding for. Their prioritization included things um, high poverty, rural, um, and can't, encloses an Indian reservation, things like that. So we didn't meet any of the prioritized criteria. Prioritized div school divisions will be selected first. Okay. They're also eligible for a higher reimbursement amount. So based on our size, our um, level of free and reduced meals, and the fact that we're not rural and we don't um, have an Indian reservation here, we fall into that non-prioritized status, and the maximum reimbursement for that is $200,000 per bus. Okay. Um, and, uh, and of course, they'll select prioritized divisions first. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, do you mind going back a slide? Uh, does, so reading this, it sounds like your ideal for replacement is 12 years. Yeah. Um, does this mean that a number of our buses will be, they, they have not been replaced? Is yeah, that right? a number of them have not been replaced. Okay. That so, is correct. Okay. Okay. And that's but not Fortunately, they're still running very well because we are a small district. Okay. So we don't put as many miles on our bus uh -huh. as some of the larger districts. So that has been a plus for us. I see. Okay. And then one more question I'll open up to the, the rest of the board. Um, I know I've heard from some of the, the students in the, uh, the district about not being able to ride on the electric buses. I think, Ms. Michael, you clarified why that is, um, or Ms. Anderson, uh, can you explain why some kids are not riding on electric buses? Well, probably because we only have two. <laughs> and um, the buses go through a process where we, we bid out routes and we award buses to the senior drivers. So we start going down the list with the top driver. And if they say, no, I don't want that electric bus, we go to the next person down on the list. So we did get down, kind of down deep into the ranks before somebody said, yeah, I'll drive that electric bus. <laughs> it's just something new. So even though they've all been trained on it and they love driving it, it's still something new. And I just think that they were apprehensive about taking that electric bus plus for my drivers who do athletics, they really don't want to have to switch out of that electric bus to get onto a diesel bus to take the team. They want to be on a bus that they drive every day, that they're comfortable in, to drive down the road. That makes you sense. know, especially when you're coming back and it's dark, you want to know your bus. So I can understand that for those drivers, but I did tell them we will be doing more training because with each bus that comes in, we retrain everybody again. Um, so hopefully they'll overcome some of the apprehension and uh, we'll take some of those electric buses as they come in. I've encouraged them to, so we'll see what happens. 
great. So, and they're fun to drive too. Well. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Anderson. Um, others from the board, questions or comments? Bethany? Thank you, super interesting. Um, I have some questions about how many students ride the bus. So in the routes, the regular routes in the morning and the afternoon, what percentage, what number of our kids ride the bus at each sort of campus cluster, maybe the way that I'd put it? Oh, gee, I really wasn't prepared for that <laughs> one. I can find out and let you know the exact number, but we do have good ridership uh, with our students. Um, a lot of our buses, as you know, uh, had some overcrowding this year. So we are making um, uh, plans to do add extra buses here and there in order to juggle some of the numbers. But I will get you that information and I'll send it over to you. Thank you. Yeah, okay. I'm curious because we know the projections show there's more kids coming. Yes, and indeed. So, we just looked at that today. <clears throat> I'm curious also what that means for this schedule if that projected increase is built in. I mean, I know some of them will be basically on top of campus eventually, but mm -hmm. what that means for the this replacement yeah. cycle and bus cost. Definitely, we're, that's why we're also already looking at adding buses to our elementary schools and to uh, the secondary as well, just to help juggle some of the loads. So we have, it's somewhere in here, we have how many buses right now, 16? We have um, 16 uh, regular route buses. And so with the replacement schedule that keeps us at 16, or we're gonna increase to? We're gonna be increasing, um, definitely. So one of the things right now, of the 16 buses that do daily runs, we have two more buses that are making the secondary runs that are making the elementary runs. So the very first thing that we'll have to do is add elementary runs on. <coughs> so right now that does give flexibility, for example, in the afternoon for athletics, because there are two drivers who don't have to do an elementary run after the secondary run. But next year with the projected growth in enrollment at the elementary level, it's likely that all 16 drivers will be doing both sets of runs. And then potentially, depending on where we are in terms of enrollment and ridership after that, we would have to add another bus utilizing one of our spares in terms of um, would be the first course of action. But it doesn't sound like we need to increase the total number of buses in the nearest term to accommodate? Yeah. Well, so for next year, it's, it's likely that we potentially will be okay, but we are projecting growth of more students for the following year, another 100 students. So I do think we're going to have to watch growth closely because as we look at the out years, we may need more buses. And then I have one other question. I live right on the edge um, of the walk zone for the both, actually, all the campuses except the little bitties. Um, and I hear a lot from my neighbors, but my kids are walking through construction. Right. No matter where they're going, they're walking through pretty significant construction. Why can't they be on the bus too? Because it's really not safe. And so a lot of the families drive their kids because it's just yeah, challenging. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know this. You know, we're already overcrowded on the buses, but I would be remiss in not asking, um, you know, how the district, how y'all think about handling that, particularly when we got such massive construction right now. Well, as I've stated, um, Dr. Noonan asked me that question the other day. But as I've stated, it's it is something we have to look at um, because. If you increase your walk zone, that will alleviate some of the crowding on the buses, and it's the quickest way to handle a situation where we don't have enough manpower or enough school buses in order to accommodate all the students. And seeing that our electric bus and our diesel bus that we've ordered is still a year out, if something of that nature occurred where we didn't have the, the resources in order to accommodate all those students, I would recommend looking at increasing our walk zone. So, th so the flip of that would be if we expand the walk zone, right. we would need more buses. Right. No, I, I yeah. understand. I guess my question was more about given the volume of construction in the city, and I know, like, I look at no. where my kids, how my, I drive my kids to school now because it is dysfunctional for them to walk. They have to walk through two major construction zones. Not awesome that I have to drive them to school every day, right? And so kind of my question is for families that may not have the flexibility that I do, to be able to drive their kids, um, whether there's anything we, as a temporary basis that we could think about because just because there is so much construction right now. Well, that is something we can think about. Um, and as I said, it depends on what our resources are and what they reflect in the numbers of the students who receive the bus services. So, but yeah, that's always something we would yeah. look at. Yeah, I appreciate it. And thank it. you for bringing that to my attention, too. It's, yeah, it's, it's good to have that in mind when we're looking forward to making plans. Yeah, I'm happy to draw you a map of where the kids are I most think I know. I'm sure I you know. I think I know. I hear about the Chevrolet neighbors <laughs> regularly. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you. Kathleen? 
Thank you so much. I found this so interesting. I really appreciate it. Um, just, I don't want to hammer this topic too much in terms of the walk zone, but on the more to um, Dr. Noonan's point on the flip side of it, in terms of expanding it, we live way where my kids would always bus, but they just prefer to walk, so they always walk anyway. So we're, I guess we're helping to alleviate the pressure on the buses most of the time. Um, they just enjoy the walk. But I'm just curious where, is there an exact, how do you decide right now what where the walk zone line is? Is it is purely by distance, or are there other factors that kind of help draw where the line currently is, regardless of whether you push it closer or farther? Well, distance is um, a main factor. Uh, normally for your secondary, you would have a mile walk zone from the property line of your school. And for elementaries, it's typical to have a half a mile uh, walk zone. So those are the things we would look at uh, when we would utilize that is standard. That, is that for Mount Daniel also, or is that different because of the hill? Well, Mount Daniel is also considered a, an elementary, so I would say yes. It's, a, it's still a, ha a full half mile? Yeah. Okay, All right. thank you. Sure thing. Other questions, comments? In terms of a uh, number of CDL drivers, how are we doing in terms of having enough CDL drivers? Right now, we're looking pretty good. As I said, we do have two sub drivers, but currently they are um, on routes. Um, we have an open route uh, every day, and we have uh, the other sub who covers whatever comes open throughout the day. Sometimes people need a morning off or an afternoon off. And plus, they also service the car drivers. Mm -hmm. So when we have a car driver that's off, we have to use one of our school bus subs to cover uh, for that route. So currently, um, I will be doing interviews tomorrow, as I said, and one of the drivers I'll be interviewing already has a CDL with the proper endorsements. So I'm really hoping that that will work out to our benefit. Then we can replace that open run with the driver and that'll free up one of our sub drivers. And every time we could free up a sub driver, that helps our athletics too, um, to, to be able to provide more service when the teams need to leave earlier. So we really try to make sure we, we keep our numbers, uh, keep our roles full and keep the bus seats full so that we can take those two subs out and they can be used to cover routes so the drivers can have the benefit of going on the field trips Great. and the athletics. Okay. Great. Okay. Kathleen? Uh, sorry, two more thoughts. Uh, one, I forgot to also just thank you for being able to sustain our, our <laughs> all of our bus drivers throughout the year. I mean, we've been hearing national about the national bus driver shortage and the crisis that some communities are facing. So kudos to you and your team for uh, keeping your staff up and keeping them happy and thank them please for us. I will, thank you. <laughs> for, uh, for the important work that they do. Um, I had another question about the electric buses and how many bus it like what is our max number of buses we could charge with our current charging system well currently we have the two buses we have two chargers um really you don't want to put more than two buses to a charger because you can rotate them out so i wouldn't say you shouldn't put more than two on a charge would, yes. we, would we need to invest in more chargers yes. with our future buses and that's been planned out with uh, dominion um, correct. Yes. So when Dominion put the original infrastructure in place, while there's only two actual chargers there, they put infrastructure in place for eight, right? right? And they paid for that as part of this bus program. Got um, it. So we do have future capacity built in. Mm -hmm. You know, they will need to put in more chargers. But do you know just very ballpark what, what the chargers cost if we add? We paid we nothing for them. To, I mean, yeah. Oh, we don't pay, pay for the chargers when they come in either. No. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. I know we talked about this at the time when we passed it all. But, but it is a good yeah. reminder. Yeah. Um, part, of, part of the deal with Dominion is that any of the infrastructure charging that happens with the buses, if there's an outage, they serve as large batteries that are available for Dominion to pull off of to the grid. Um, if they're on the charger. And so that's part of the trade-off that we have of having the infrastructure. Seems, I don't know if I said like that right, <laughs> Dr. Ortiz, right. but, but essentially they're large batteries that um, Dominion can use uh, as they need to if they're on the charger. That's great, that seems like a fair trade. Thanks. Other questions or thoughts for Ms. Anderson? Yes, Lori. I just wanted to say thank you for keeping our kids safe and for every, I, I know that keeping the bus drivers here um, <coughs> and being fully staffed is a difficult task and keeping our kids safe every day is a difficult task. So just thank you for everything you're doing. 
Well, I just would like to thank you all and parents if you have students that ride. Um, I've worked several school districts and by far I think that the behaviors um, on our school buses are the best I've seen. So thank you to what you do to encourage your students um, to act responsibly. So we really, and usually if I have a problem, if I ask them, you know, hey, can we not say that or do that, they will apologize and they always thank us for the ride. Very polite, very mannerable, so thank you. Well, with a daughter on bus patrol, she works very hard, so. <laughs> Thank you, Laura, for the comments. Yeah, and thanks, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Michael, for the presentation, the education about this. We really appreciate you. You've had a long day, so thanks for <laughs> staying with us and, and helping us out with this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. All right. You're more than welcome to stay for the, the Richard Kane show, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yes. But you're more the than Richard Kane show has been, been promised it won't last more than 20 minutes. But <laughs> yes. um, <laughs> I've been told, I've been told. <laughs> so. Anyway, it's, uh, it, if we can go ahead, Absolutely. I'd be happy to um, welcome Richard. Um, you know, Richard, obviously, one of the things he'll tell you first of all and foremost is that he loves food. And because he loves food, he loves working with food. And um, we are very fortunate to have Richard as our uh, food services director here in Falls Church City of Public Schools. He cooks everything from scratch. Um, it all tastes delicious. Um, and, uh, and, and we um, always love to hear his story. So we've, been, we've actually been doing some menu planning before the meeting. Uh, because one of the things you'll learn tonight is what constitutes a USDA meal and the requirement from USDA. And I'm convinced that there are some things you could put together like in a burrito or a wrap that along with milk would constitute a full meal, but it takes a lot of veggies to do that. But anyway, without further ado, let me turn it over to Richard. Uh, I like to Kane. say that doesn't count against my minute. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> First of all, before I start, I haven't had an opportunity to meet most of you school board members. And I like to say um, thank you for having me here tonight. I also like to answer one question that Ms. Silverman said earlier when she said, what did we do to deserve cookies? And what you have done for the whole school district is you work very diligently to make sure that we have great policies and become one of the best districts in the country. And that's my way of saying thank you for everything that you do, because I'm sure you don't get it all the time. So I want to say thank you. Now I can start. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I've been here for 17 years um, in this district. My whole background is nothing but food. I was a former chef. I've also ran B&I accounts. And what I hope to accomplish tonight is to give you an overview of my department so that you'll understand um, how it operates. So if you look at the screen, I want to introduce you to my team who I call my family. I spend most of my time with them here. So, and I've been working with most of them the whole time I've been here. So on the top of the screen, I have my team over at Mount Daniel. Um, Tito, who's the young man there, gentleman there, he's the manager there. At the secondary campus, I have my team there. Cindy Morell, who's the assistant director, who's sitting in the back right there, um, runs both of those schools. And then at the bottom, I have Oak Street, and Jennifer, um, second from the left, um, is the manager at that school. My team consists of 16 members, and they're from different places around the world. They represent 10 countries. They speak 11 languages. Some of these languages I didn't know, so there is no misspelling up there. Um, and all of my managers are 100% serve safe certified, which means they're certified to make sure that the food is safe in everything that we serve every day. My average team member, family member, has been here average of 14 years, which is long um, um, and great in a lot of respects. And in other respects, you know, that means they're gonna, some of them are gonna reach retirement soon, all right? So we're responsible for, of course, all five schools. We have the Mustang Mug, um, I'm gonna call it the beverage shop because coffee is not the only thing we serve. So I wanna make sure everybody understands that. Um, we do all the catering, special events, we're in charge of the vending, and um, there are a lot of innovative initiatives that I'm gonna talk about, and we also um, work with students with um, learning differences. Okay, 
the offerings that we have up there, of course, is breakfast and lunch. And for some of you who may or may not know, we also offer a backpack program for those who don't have enough food to eat on the weekend. I'm very serious about food insecurity, so we make sure they have that. Um, I also started the hydroponic program um, a few years back in the aquaponics program with in collaboration with the science department. Um, and we also working on robotic farming. And we do that right now, uh, working on that in collaboration with the maintenance department. And we also do it with the IT department. Now, somebody down in Washington, D.C. decided that we need to have something other than um, what you're used to when you go out to eat, like combo meals, you know, a main entree and stuff like that. So a USDA meal consists of what they call five components. Five components, the five components are a fruit, a vegetable, a grain, a protein, and a dairy. So for breakfast, we have to offer a minimum of three items, a maximum of four items, and for lunch, a maximum of three, and a, I'm sorry, a minimum of three and a maximum of five. So in order to try to break this down as simple as possible, when you have, a, in order to have a meal, a meal must include a fruit or vegetable. If it does not, it's not considered a meal. Now, the reason they call it components, if you have a sandwich, you have two components right off the bat. That's two. So when you see something, it could not technically be, con it's technically considered a meal, but a person may not consider it a meal. For instance, you can have a fruit, a slice of bread and some milk and USDA technically that is considered a meal. I did not make the rules. I did not make the law, but that's the way it is. <laughs> now, some of the programs I have started since I've been here, I started the backpack program in 2008. I got here in 2007. Um, we did everything from working with students with different um, um, learning differences. Um, that is one of my favorite programs because the students, everything that we take for granted in the kitchen or in life in general, like counting, um, knowing um, where to put things, we work with them. We work with students right now, and they learn how to put away inventory. They learn how to count. They learn color coordination, and they do all that um, at the secondary campus with me, which has become very important. Um, we used to do a program called the Husky Chef Competition, which is like Iron Chef for those of you who are into food. Um, we did that, it was very successful. And we also moved on to hydroponics, aquaponics, and robotic farming. Oh, and I also had partnerships with Job Corps um, and La Casina in Arlington to help supplement when I have labor challenges, which are always ongoing. Now, one of the best things that I like to do to get the community involved and in alignment with the strategic program is we get everybody together when I do food testing. I try to do these four times a year. So the one that you see up on the screen, we did in conjunction with voting. So what they're eating, the, the, the first picture to your left is the voting ballot. On this particular day, last October, I mean last November, we had ginger chicken on the menu, um, on this ballot. We had a honey cake on this ballot. And um, we had whether they liked it with a topping of cream or not. The middle picture is the ballot box that people got to cast their ballots into once they taste the food. And then just like when you go vote, you got a sticker that said, uh, I voted in the food taste testing. <laughs> that lets you know that you cast your ballot and let everybody know. The picture, the large picture over the top, we have faculty, we have the principals there, we have teachers there. We have some of my staff, maintenance people there, and students there. The picture at the bottom, I have central office personnel. You see Trish right there. You see Miss Cicely. You see Kristen. And then they're, they're eating with my staff. And you also see um, Debbie Hiscock. They came and, and tested it with my staff and were able to give com um, comments on it. The reason I, I do this is because a lot of times you meet people like my staff who never get a chance to meet. Um, like school board members, you know, um, other people at central office, 
I met teachers that I didn't know they were there. They've been there six years. I thought they were brand new because they never come from upstairs. So this is why I do this. Um, now, here's a snapshot of January of this year. And to explain this, I broke it down by school so that you can get a better understanding of the numbers. Breakfast meals, of course, at Jesse Thackeray, 425. Mount Daniel, 1,587 meals, and so on. Same thing for the lunch menus. I put the total a la carte sales on there, um, $1.30. Somebody brought, I guess, two milks at the school. <laughs> we don't really have a lot of a la carte there. Um, and at Mount Daniel, all the way up to the secondary. The secondary in the, uh, um, the secondary campus does a lot in a la carte sales. The reason I have a la carte sales up there is because um, when you have, if you don't have a meal, it's considered a la carte. So if your child goes through the line and they don't get a fruit or vegetable, it's charged a la carte. So it falls under that category. If you buy anything extra, it's called a la carte. If you have a second meal, because the statistics up there that you're about to see on the next line is considered a la carte. USDA, the federal government, only counts the first complete meal as a meal. So in our district, we're a little bit upside down when it comes to looking at things like free and reduce. So I put on there free and reduce, and then on each line, you see it broken down by school. We have currently right now about 18% free and reduce. When I got here, free and reduce was 5%, and it's been going up a little bit every year. The participation rate for each school seems low, but I also I want to point out again that the participation rate is only based on a complete meal in the first meal. So those numbers are a little off. Looking at 29% and 4%, the students eat a lot of a la carte. So if you look up at the a la carte line, you see that we do $22,000. This is in one month that we do. Our revenue sources come from um, USDA, and of course we do some catering, and we do other things. So we have three categories of reimbursements from the federal government. There's paid, the ones who are not on free and reduce. There's reduce and then you have free meals. The reimbursements that we get back for each meal, so if a paid student goes through the line and get a complete meal, we get 38 cents back from the United States government. If they're on reduced, and this is according to income or free, we get a dollar and 98 cent back, and for free meals, we get $2 and 28 cent back. That's for breakfast. For lunch, it's 40 cents for each paid student. It's $3.85 for reduced meals, and we have for free meals is $4.25 a meal. The backpack program that we started, um, that you see up there on the screen, is what we give them for a typical weekend. It is fresh produce, it is fresh fruit and vegetables, they have raw chicken, they have cheese, Sometimes we give them eggs. In this picture, they have corn. And the reason we give them fresh vegetables, when I first got here, I started researching um, what do food banks give people. And a lot of times when I went and visited the food banks, they were giving them canned goods, a lot of things that shout, this person basically is poor. So I felt like in order for them to go home and not feel like they're having a handout, I wanted that when they take food home to their kids, it's just like you went to the supermarket. There is no difference. It's the same thing you would see in Giants or anything. We do this in collaboration with the um, um, Education Foundation. They give us $50. This month they gave us $50 to give to the families who are underserved also once a month. So they, we do that in collaboration with them, and we also, in collaboration, with the um, Special Education Department, Rebecca Sharp. I work very closely with the liaisons, the family liaisons. I work very closely with the social workers, and I work very closely with the principals and staff to make sure that anybody in this district does not fall through the gaps. 
These are some of the awards that I've won and some of the recognition that I have received since I've been here. I was invited to the White House to meet Chef Sam Cass along with a few other schools in this um, vicinity from cooking from scratch. We got awards for the Hef, um, Husky Chef program when I was running it. And because of that program, we had Dorothy McCullough, who was the first lady of Virginia, come and see us. I've won awards for having the best food safety out of 2,800 restaurants in um, Fairfax County. Only 12 were selected. So that's the Golden Carrot Award. Um, and then I also, because of the um, um, hydroponics and the aquaponics, we got a EPA presidential award when we um, presented to them. And I've been on TV and in the newspapers and guest speaker at Food for Kids who modeled their whole program after the Husky Chef program. Opportunities and challenges. There's always opportunities. I think I can do a better job of explaining why we use plastic trays, why we have cardboard trays. And as you know, the flavor of the year is sustainability, which all of you hear about. And I'm willing to do anything with sustainability, but sustainability costs money and is not an easy problem to overcome. The whole line, for instance, if you say we want to go to plastic trays, that means you got to wash them. And if we talk about real sustainability, those chemicals go down into the water system and they still pollute unless you're willing to pay for organic chemicals. Um, the perception of when your kid comes home and say, they've ran out of food. I want you to ask your children, did they run out of food or did they run out of what you like? There's a big difference. We always have food, but we may run out of pepperoni and only have cheese or vice versa. So we never run out of food. I have parents who call me very upset that we ran out of food and they had nothing to eat. We always, always, always have something to eat. All right. Challenges. Um, some of my challenges short term is always finding staff, qualified staff. Um, and long term, I have staff who are going to be aging out very soon, which means for us as being a small district, that's like almost chopping off your arm. So that makes it going to be very challenging. And, um, and the other thing is, you know, student capacity challenges. So people always say you have a long line. But I want you to remember that when they say I have a long line, I have like 200 kids coming down to eat at one time. And no matter what food establishment you're at in this country, you cannot get them through that fast. You only can move so fast. And so with that, any questions and answers? Any questions? I can answer for you. I'll be more than happy. I hope well, I made sure. it under the 20. You did. You did. <laughs> yes. That I was, was going fast, so I apologize. No, we appreciate Mr. Kane and Ms. Morell for uh, for showing up. I know she's hiding way back there. Um, <laughs> no, and 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 uh, yeah, just some opening comments, and then we'll turn over to the board. I, um, uh, Kathleen and I had the privilege of of meeting with you all and shadowing you and learning about this firsthand. Um, and I think what what Falls Church City is constantly known for is you've got elementary school teachers that love their kids, and you've got middle school teachers that love their kids, and high school teachers. You've got You've got administrators that love their jobs. And I know when we went, um, we felt like you all really loved what you did. You had meals for religious reasons. You had meals for dietary reasons. Um, there was so much individual attention. I don't think most people understand or see it. And we came on a Friday, and your whole staff was individually making every single pizza, which um, for, for 2,000 kids, that's, uh, and that's, I think, the most popular day. Um, it is, it is impressive. And, and the other thing I think, if anyone does get a chance to, to uh, shadow, um, I challenge anyone's personal kitchen to try to be cleaner than Mr. Kane's and Ms. Morell's. That is, uh, yeah, that is a, uh, what, what is your, your philosophy? I think you came from commercial, right? So that was your philosophy for clean kitchen? Yes, yes. I, I, I take it very seriously about clean kitchens, food from scratch. I don't feed anything to anybody's child who's here or in our district without me tasting it first. Everything on our menu, I have tasted. If it don't get past me, it has to go through me before it gets on the menu. If it ain't right and I go to a school and it's not right, I pull it off the line. And if you see anything, please email me. If you have any family recipes you wanna share, please email me. You know, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm real serious, I love food 
and I have an opportunity to speak in front of everybody who's an expert because we all eat food and it's probably the only industry where everybody's an expert. Yeah. Everybody. <laughs> So. No, we appreciate that. Yeah. And, um, and, and one question before we get to the questions uh, from the board, um, the food services is a separate budget, correct? You have to raise your own money and pay for all of your own expenses. That is uh, correct. There's no subsidizing from at least the board's budget here. You're getting money from federal government. Is that correct? That is correct. I do get a transfer to cover um, summer school and certain activities just for the summer, but for all intents and purposes our budget is separate from everything else it has to be self-sustaining and this is the law self-sustaining okay no i appreciate that okay lori thank you thank you for, uh, very much for this presentation i have a few questions if that's okay sure um one is what is the definition of fruit or vegetable i remember under dan quayle ketchup was a vegetable that so, used to be the case also tomato sauce used to be a vegetable okay that is no longer the case they have changed the usda rules and a vegetable as you think it or a fruit as you think it is correct. Okay. There's no more sauce as a vegetable. Or, or tricks. You know, to me, if you say that the, the meal needs to have a fruit or vegetable, I'm not going to be surprised with what that fruit or vegetable might be. It is going to be an actual piece of fruit or an actual vegetable. It's not going to be something that my mind won't consider a fruit or vegetable. There's only one thing. Concentrated um, juice, 100% juice, a half a cup is considered a quarter vegetable but i do not use fruit i do not use juice as a fruit and i do not use it as a vegetable thank you because so, our pediatrician would also call it a sugar and not a fruit right i do not do that thank you so um second question um do any treats come with this like a cookie every day or any sort of extra treats i do not serve desserts with my lunches if they want dessert they have to purchase it separately Great. I love that, too. Um, number three, any thoughts on, and I don't know if this would be your jurisdiction or something different, any thoughts on composting? Composting. Always thoughts on He's composting. He's got lots of thoughts about composting. <laughs> okay, yay. I, I'm happy we're in the same boat then. Oh, Maybe. you're in the same boat. Okay. But see, I'm, I'm a very big composter. I'm going to try to keep it short. <laughs> you can't just say composting. You have to think about the whole process. Composting requires you to store that food somewhere, which attracts rodents. You got to have a container for it. You got to have people trained, your students trained to make sure they put it in the right facilities. And then we have to get it there. And for what I understand, it is not that cheap, but that's not up to me. I will do whatever everybody wants, but you have to train the students. Everybody wants it, but nobody wants to do it the right way. It's like sort of like... Um, everybody want to eat healthy, but fast food is still in business. I feel like with recycling, there, there must have been a, a, a path that people, students, adults, whoever, had to take in order to figure out what's recyclable and what's not. And I still feel like I'm looking for the little triangle on every single pl piece of plastic I use to see, you know, what's recyclable or not. So it, would it be the same learning curve with composting? Um, it would be the learning curve. And we've been looking at that. We started with daycare. They're looking at doing a pilot. They started to teach them from a very young age because, honestly, mm -hmm. at the high school, they just not going to do it because they don't want to be told what to do. They're just not going to do it. So I think if you teach children from a very young age that they could learn it. But also, um, with the little triangle, what you need to understand that when you once you put food in it, it's not recyclable right away. It has to go to some special type of recycling center in order to be recycled, which all trucks don't have here. I was just talking with the, um, um, I think they're called the compost crew here, um, when they came around with Brian um, Fowler, and they cannot do the plastic because they say that takes, even though it has the triangle, it takes special processing, which they're not prepared for. So we have been doing our research on a year since I've been here to make sure that I keep up with all the trends. I even researched having dishes rewashed. There's a company up in New York that does it. They wash them, bring it back, sanitize, so you don't do it, and they do it all healthy-wise. But it's a new concept. Well, if there's any, you know, this is your specialty, not mine, and you know the obstacles to composting, you know, such as the rodents, such as bringing it outside, that kind of thing. If there's any way that... I don't want to speak for the board, but at least myself can be helpful with trying to get 
um, composting in the schools. I'm, I'm all, I'm definitely in favor of it, and you know, would would support whatever you know we need it in, in order to get that done. Um, my last comment question, um, and, and um, Chair Gould had brought this up, is about the dietary restrictions. Um, I really applaud our school district, and and I am a family that hasn't needed the separate dietary restrictions. However, I might be on the verge of needing the dietary restrictions for one of my kids. And so if you can just let the community know um, what, what types of different products do you, uh, not products, but what, what types of restrictions do you, are, are you able to take care of through the food services? Every time I get a dietary restriction, I work directly with the parent. And I work with the parent for two reasons. Um, the first reason is, let's say you're gluten free. I want to make sure I get something that the student wants to eat. I can order all kind of gluten-free products, but if you don't eat it, it's not helping. So what I do is when I talk to the parent, I wanna know what do they eat at home, what brands they eat, so then I can bring it in. We have to bring things in in bulk, and if I can't get it in bulk, then I have to get it in smaller size and buy it retail. Because we're a small district, I don't have as big of a problem, so I don't mind making special arrangements to make sure that kid can eat. We also um, take care of people who eat halal, you know, I make sure I deal with vendors that have halal, and if we and I do the same thing with them. I ask them, okay, what do they eat? What kind of things? Because just like being a Catholic or being anything else, there are different levels. Or a vegan, there are different levels. Some people say I'm a vegan, but they eat eggs. You know, so I, I make sure I understand the needs of the parent. So if you're going to have one, you're going to have to talk to me eventually. <laughs> this is so exceptional. Um, so thank you for everything. You're welcome. Mr. Lewin, Sean. Um, I mean, sort of looping back to the composting conversation, um, I am a part of the sustainability in action group at the high school, and I feel as though there are so many students on the secondary campus specifically that would be like so passionate and excited to collaborate to help with finding a solution to that issue. And um, especially like with, with Ms. Pollock and other staff members, um, but this just sort of reminds me of that. I feel like there's a lot of students who would be really, really interested and excited in exploring solutions to like help implement composting, especially in the cafeteria, and like helping to like coordinate it. Because I know that there was like a big um, sort of organizational effort that was done last spring to like help with making um, like the plastics, better like, the yeah, like better organized and better like sort of posted as to what can be recycled and what can't be um, so that we can, you know, help with our sustainable efforts at the school. I understand. I've been on a lot of those panels with the students. I've come to the classroom. I've spoken to them. I don't know if you were in any of them that I've been in. You was. <laughs> so I spoke to the students and I'm all for it. You know, I work with the students, I work with the staff, I work with the principals. So whatever you guys, if we can coordinate, it, it requires collaboration from everybody. Because everybody just wants to look at food service and say what you're not doing, you can't do this. But the students are not putting it in the right recycle bin or whatever. One of the things that came up that this, that came up this year was that we were using a lot of plastic and a lot of cardboard. So what I did was after talking to Mr. Law, I got rid of the cardboard and you only can use it on the salad bar. And that was it, just to see what the students would say. Students, I got maybe three or four complaints, you know, but we used the plastic and we used the containers because we have a labor shortage. So without a labor shortage, with a labor shortage, I don't have people to serve the food that's traditionally done. So what we do is we, pre, we make the food from scratch, we put it in containers, and we stack it on the line. It has to be in certain types of plastic because it keeps the food hot. We've been through a lot of different products, and some of them are melt in the warmers and stuff like that. So the ones that we use, they can withstand temperatures up to like 400 degrees. So yeah, I'm willing to work with you guys anytime. All you got to do is email me or come see me. Thank you. Uh, Amy? To start by saying, wow. Um, I had no idea that it was, food services was as extensive as this presentation showed. Um, and I'm really excited that this, you know, is how it operates. Um, 
My question has to do with how you, what efforts, and it's kind of along the same lines as composting and everything, how you limit food waste, um, ensuring that we're not, you know, making too much uh, so that we have a lot of waste. What do you do to do that? Great question. I love that question. We do what you call batch cooking. We only make enough food for each lunch period. So sometime when they move students around and we have more in one lunch period than another, which happens sometime at the secondary campus, then they got to wait for us to finish cooking the food. But we only do batch cooking. We do, we have as minimal amount of leftovers as possible. Sometimes we get down to the last 10 students and they have to wait five minutes for us to cook off a hamburger or something like that. So we very rarely have a lot of leftovers. We don't throw away almost anything it does happen i'm not gonna lie it does happen i want you looking in my trash can talking about that's a burrito but <laughs> but we have very minimal food waste okay. thank you you're welcome bethany thank you for all this information what you do is incredibly impressive uh thank you resources and i just want to particularly compliment you on the backpack program having seen i know what looks like what's in the pictures haven't seen it, uh, and families that benefited from it, and it's really unique. I've worked with schools in other districts where that is not the case, um, and so I really appreciate your attention to that. Thank you very much. Yeah, David. <clears throat> Thanks for coming, Mr. Kane. Your passion for the work is is obviously uh, infectious. Um, <laughs> I think I think I might choose another career, depending <laughs> on how things go the next couple of weeks. Um, but I'd like to ask the following, you know, the, the, the nutritional needs for students changes um, as they grow. Um, and I want to know, like, how your, um, how the, the meals, or maybe perhaps educate us how the meals change in terms of caloric needs as well as other nutritional needs for the students as they move from the Mount Daniel program all the way up to uh, the secondary campus. You want to know how they change? Like what's the you know the you know the, the calorie changes the the different options that are available to students how much your provide how much um, uh, um, opportunities they have for choosing at the different levels et cetera I think it's it seems that uh, that you've really tailored it to the to the to the customer. Yes. Okay. The way they change USDA also has a calorie um, chart that for the elementary schools they get a certain amount of calories. You have to do actually like a certain type of vegetable. So we have to do like beans once a week. You have to offer dark greens a couple of times a week. You have to do an orange vegetable and stuff like that. And then with all that being said, then they have sodium requirements. They have um, calorie requirements between the elementary school system, the elementary school and the secondary schools. And we have to follow that chart. They do an audit on us. Every three years, I just had my audit um, this school year, and we had just a couple of findings, and they had nothing to do with the food. So that's how we, ha we follow what the USDA federal government says. Now, in order to, if you follow exactly what they say, say I'm not saying I don't, but in order to get the kids to eat food, I find out what they like to eat. So we do that in several ways. We talk to the students individually. We say, oh, what do you eat? And what I've learned from talking to students is they always say, I don't know. What do you want to say? I don't know. So then I changed my questioning to when you eat out, where do you eat? And then when they answer that question, I said, when you eat at like Chipotle, what do you eat? And from those answers, I'm able to tailor it towards the school. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Kathleen. I enjoyed my day shadowing in your department so much. I don't think we highlighted enough how from scratch the food is. It was really fun to see all the ingredients and see them actually. Like, it made me want to just roll up my sleeves and, and start cooking food, to, to David's point. I mean, it really uh, is so impressive. Um, I have job openings. <laughs> <laughs> so tempting. Uh, my question, I was just surprised to see the difference in the 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 breakfast at Mount Daniel versus Oak Street. Why? D what what do you account for? I mean, it's a similar number of students. So, but there's three times as many kids getting breakfast there. Do you know why? Um, I think. Um, let me look at that chart before I answer. You said between Mount Daniel and Oak Street, the breakfast. 
It's on slide seven, yeah. Yeah, I see it. I see it. Oak Street has 572 to 1587. Um, just from my own personal experience, I think in the morning time, kids don't really want to eat that much, especially when they get to uh, middle school. And if you look at the middle school, it's the same thing. They don't eat a whole lot of breakfast, but you also have to keep in mind um, um, from talking to parents, a lot of parents want to make breakfast for their kids. You know, usually, and it's flip-flop over the years since I've been here. I've been here 17 years. So usually it goes up linear, but here it went the other way. You know, there are kids, there are parents who say, I, I hear your food is good, but I want to make, I feel like I'm a bad mother or father if I don't do lunch or breakfast for my kid. I cannot beat that. I recommend mom make food. I don't want to go against mom. Yeah. So I recommend that. But I cannot 100% explain it. Other than that maybe parents don't have time in the morning and they want to send them and get breakfast that way or they want to make it. Right. So it switches. I, w I wonder if there's a, um, just observing both of those, if there's a proximity um, piece to consider too. When you come into... Oak Street, you have to go to the right to get your breakfast, but at Mount Daniel, you're in the chute, <laughs> and as you go by, you grab it, and I, I wonder if there's something about going off the beaten path to have to go get your get your breakfast. But That, that was my I'm suspicion as well, um, and if they thought kids were, I mean, they have to punch in their number for breakfast too, right, just like, as they're going through for lunch? Um, that's, at the um, elementary for level? For lunch, that is correct. Um, they now punch in the number for breakfast. At Oak Street, we bought a wireless computer upstairs, but I believe at Mount Daniel, because they have all their numbers usually on them, or Tito knows who they are, they're able to write down the numbers as they come through. I wonder if it's also just a more passive experience for the Mount Daniel kids. There maybe it, it's just curious. There's nothing right or wrong. Just was surprised by those numbers. Been Thanks. an interesting experiment. Uh huh. Yeah. I'm just curious if daycare enrollment has anything. Morning daycare has anything to do with it? That I don't know. I know they are already there at um, Mount Daniel and Oak Street, but I don't. I've never followed where they go. I know they leave once daycare is over, but I don't think I really paid that much attention or correlated it. That is interesting, though. Now I'm probably gonna pay attention. <laughs> once I hear it, I can't unhear it. Uh, and I had another question about breakfast also. When we were there on our shadow day, um, I think you mentioned that the middle school would love to have more options at breakfast, but it's a staffing challenge to offer. Is that correct? Am I remembering that correct? You are correctly? remembering that correctly. The middle school wanted the same thing as the high school because the high school has a hot buffet. So what we did was to increase their offerings on the middle school. We gave them some hot items already um, prepackaged, a few of them over there. But they, they can pick and choose, mix and match cereals and different yogurts and stuff like that. Right. So has that been popular, the hot items that you're able to provide at the middle um, school? Breakfast over there um, this year seems to be down for whatever reason. I don't know what it is. Um, other than I think middle school kids don't want to eat in the morning. I had the same problem with my kids. Yeah. They didn't want to eat, but then they get really hungry at lunch. Ideally, would you would you prefer to have more staffing for middle school breakfast, or do you feel like it, where you are now is? is I would good? feel that I need more staffing overall, not just for breakfast. Lunch is the bigger meal. Across the board, or, or on the Across secondary the campus? Board. Across the board. On the, on the secondary campus. Okay. But I'm also going to need them on the elementary campus because I have people retiring who've been here who are going to be leaving us probably Got shortly. It. <laughs> us and that's another thing right. half my staff worked for her right so works with transportation not for her transportation so that retirement challenge is it's going to impact both of us right got it okay any other questions or thoughts bethany yeah actually, i actually have a question about that because it seems like both of your departments have special certifications <coughs> required right there's food safety certifications and there's driver certifications um what is the population of people like as you're thinking about how you're going to replace these folks where there's that intersection like are you find people and you train them into the certifications you find people who people have 
both. I mean, I'm just curious, like, what pool of people there is and if there's anything we can do as a district to make that combo, which seems like it maybe is a win-win for everybody more. In my popular. department, we train them. I, I can't speak for Yeah, that's Regina. the same with us. Uh, we're, oops. Sometimes we're fortunate, like I said, with the person I'm interviewing tomorrow, to have a retiree from one school district come over to ours and um, work for us. But most times we go through a process um, through the CDL office where we provide the training from ground floor up um, and testing for that driver so that they can get their CDL. Um, and with the, the aids that I have, it's another training program that we put them through. It's no certification, but we try to keep ongoing training available um, as things change. Yeah. Much like Ms. Silverman said with the composting, um, this is an area that interests me about how we can help optimize for this for both of you. So if there's anything that I can do as a board member to help draw attention, because y'all both seem like wonderful people to work for, uh, to draw attention to that um, and help make this, you know, folks go, oh, this would be a great job because you can get the whole day and do different interesting things still in the same space. Yeah. I'd be glad to help. And anybody I interview for aid, I do put, a, put a, um, an advertisement in for our food service, but I do let them know, this is not your typical cafeteria work. You will learn to cook if you don't know how to cook. You will work. So, yeah, so sometimes they don't quite understand that until they, they delve into me. his world, and they're like, mm, no, mm -mm. no, I just want to help the kids. No. A lot of schools around here do heat and serve. We do not do heat and serve. We actually wash that chicken and bake it so you can eat it. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay, Mr. Kane, Ms. Morell, yep, question. of course you're going to be, yeah, no problem. Just one for the whole school board. Does anybody here have special allergies or uh, vegans or anything? I have allergies, yes. To food, I'm talking about. Yes, yeah, yes, to food. <laughs> <laughs> May I ask if, because if I ever want to do anything for the school board, oh, oh, I oh. ask this of everybody, including Dr. Noonan and, and everybody. I just would like to know for the oh, future. Oh, I, I, I have kind of a list. I, so how, how about, a, how about if I collect it? I'm, I'll, I'll I'm let you allergic know. to I'm sorry, things. I don't eat pork or shellfish. Like I've got a, I've got a list of okay. things that I right. don't do. That's fine. Dr. Noonan said he isn't. I, I just thought I, I had to answer I, yes. I have something. Okay. I did not have to <laughs> <laughs> publicly list everything. All right. That was my only question. Thank you for allowing me to present tonight. No, thank you, Mr. Kane. Thank you, Ms. Morell, for coming by. We really appreciate the, the conversation. So thanks a thank lot. You. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, and uh, now we're going to move on to uh, section 2.03. We're going to continue our conversation with parents as coaches uh, and to remind the public as well as the folks in attendance, um, we are continuing our conversation. Last uh, work session, we provided a number of questions around what we were looking forward to or what we were interested in around a, a possible policy or action around parents as coaches, um, and the staff uh, spent uh, – Great amount of time to put this together, so we appreciate that. We have two uh, guests, uh, honored guests, Mr. Park, Mr. Laub, so we appreciate it. Mr. Laub, I assume you're here for parents as coaches as well? That's what I'm here for. All right, so we look forward to being able to field questions to all of you, We're look, and I think we'll turn this over to Dr. Noonan. I, you just said just about everything I was going to say. <laughs> so um, just want to thank um, Mr. Laub and Mr. Park for being here on, an, on another night out. I know that <clears throat> our high school team is out a lot, um, and as the spring sports gear up, they're going to be uh, out even more. But also want to just appreciate their time um, pulling this together. Also, the time that Trisha took to pull the policy together, the time that um, uh, uh, several people took pulling these uh, questions together. And I know tonight um, this work session will be led by Dr. Bates, and uh, he's going to walk through some of these questions at a pretty high level. But Mr. Park and Mr. Laub are also here to answer any questions, that you, additional questions that you may have. Well, thank you. And thank you, Chair Gould and Vice Chair Tice, members of the board, for allowing us to engage in this conversation. Um, just for um, kind of like parameters for the conversation. If it's okay, um, I can go through the questions. I can state the question and then just give a couple of brief um, comments on the questions. And then if there aren't any further questions from the board, um, I'll go on to the next question. If there are questions um, from the board, then as uh, Dr. Noonan shared, we have um, Principal Laub and our athletic director, Brian Park, here to 
provide commentary. That sounds great. So kind of mirroring the the Kristen Michael approach to budget questions. The Kristen the Kristen yes. um, <laughs> Michael approach to <laughs> parents as coaches. That sounds great. Yes. Okay. okay. Sounds great. All right. So the first question here we have is how frequently does the head coach have a student on the team that they are coaching, and what is the frequency by sport? And so we looked at the twenty three twenty. 24 data and uh, we have one head coach um, in our example and uh, that is one head coach of a VHSL sanctioned sport and then we also have one head coach of a non-sanctioned VHSL sport which would be considered a club sport and that's uh, volleyball. We have several assistant coaches who have their own student or their own child on the team that they're coaching. Great. Questions or comments around question number one? Maybe? Uh, just a fairly straightforward question. Do, do we not have the data from, I think the question asked, or maybe it did just ask, it didn't, it didn't give a time frame, but how far back do we have the data? I'm wondering, do we have data from like, you know, the previous school year, maybe three years back? Um, yes, we can get the data back from two years, from when, as long as I've been here. I've been here at Meridian High School for three years. I could go back and get that data, and I would just have to correlate it with our rosters um, to see what participants were participating on what team and what coach was the head coach or the assistant coach at that time, as well as volunteer coaches. Okay. So I could go back three years. I, I, I think that would, might be worthwhile simply because um, – maybe a, a one-year snapshot doesn't fully reflect how often this has occurred for some of the board members that may not be familiar with some of some other instances well, when I look at the data um, that we pulled for the one year this is a typical uh, I guess uh, representation of, of a yearly a yearly uh, coaching staff of 83 to 100 coaches uh, on staff for, for us uh, including volunteers so uh, typically, you're going to get one to two head coaches, maybe. Okay. Um, but the most of the support staff is where the parents are the ones helping out um, with the uh, JV programs or with the varsity programs, but as a volunteer or as assistant coach. So the representation is there, but I could gather more data for you. Okay. Thank you. The only thing I was going to add was that there was a sim there is a similar question later that does ask for a time frame, and we just simply to correlate it and to get it in this time, because as Brian said, we have to skim over the rosters as well to be, to see like did this person have a player? I don't, we don't know. Um, I tried to. I've been at the high school now for 13 years, and I tried to rack my brain and like really. I think this snapshot does do a fair representation of what even my memory can serve of it, but. We'll try to go back with those rosters for at least from Brian's time there. I'm sorry, I stepped out. Um, and I don't mean to backtrack. Um, and I missed the question, obviously, but are you asking for previous to 23, 24 data? I, I didn't know if they kept the data. And if, if okay. I didn't know if they kept the data, and that was why we only got okay. a snapshot from last year. Um, if the data is ready, readily available and it's not too hard to get, it may be worth uh, pulling. I mean, I, I'm a, uh, personally, I'm aware of some other instances, so I don't necessarily need it for myself, but it could be, um, it could be helpful for other people to know if we could go back, like, let's say, to the previous three years. So, so if, we, if we determine that it's not easily accessible, I think that's we fine. can sure. let you know, yeah. okay? Because this was this was challenging yes, for him no, to go back and to power school because sometimes the names are different between the adults and the kids, and mm -hmm. trying to figure all that out was a challenge. That was one of the things that took so many hours. Thanks. Sorry to step out. Okay. All right. So we'll go ahead and jump into question two. Second question: Is there something in place regarding parents as coaches, and do parents want to coach their kid after um, they've gotten cut? And so we don't have anything as far as policy and regulation as far as um, restricting coaches um, from being or parents from being coaches of their uh, children in a uh, sport or activity. Um, we also looked at our neighboring school districts and they don't have regulations or policies either written about 
parents who also want to be a head coach or an assistant coach of a team that their student would participate on. Okay. Questions or comments about this? Okay. All right, question three. What is the selection process for athletic teams? The, we do have a tryout process and that is highlighted in the athletics handbook at Meridian High School and it can be found on pages 20 to 22. And VHSL, again, so when we're talking about sports that are sanctioned by the VHSL, they do have specific eligibility requirements. And um, we've listed some of those uh, requirements there. And then our coaching staff, they're responsible for conducting the tryouts and developing the criteria, the selection criteria, skill-based criteria, um, or experience criteria, and typically those tryouts will run for a three-day period um, at a minimum, but they could run longer than that. And then we added a note there at the bottom around the collaboration that the coaches engage in daily. And so that is once um, a team is set or a roster is set, our coaches meet daily, whether it's prior to, during practice, after practice, um, prior to games, after games, after reviewing film, to make determinations on which student athletes put the team in the best position to be competitive. Questions or comments about the eligibility or the trial process? David, is that a? Oh, no, you're just looking. Okay. All right. Thanks, Dr. Bates. Thanks. Is it easier for uh, is it easier to find coaches for more popular sports than those with more spe uh, more specific skill set? And uh, we shared that it oftentimes it is. And and again, based upon popularity, we threw a, a number in there for you. So in, in looking at some of the uh, like a quick cursory look at the data, I found that a, Right, ab right around a million, a little over a million student athletes play uh, football. And I um, tried to cross-reference that with um, field hockey, and um, it was around 60,000 students. And so again, based upon the number, if, if we look at playing a particular sport as a pathway to um, gaining experience to then become a coach or having a love for a, a sport as a student athlete and participating in that sport either in high school or college and, and wanting to continue to remain close to the sport and that being a pathway or segue to eventually becoming the coach or a coach, uh, it's just, it just offers a much wider, broader pool of applicants who may have an interest in being a coach of a, one sport versus another. That makes sense. Questions about the popularity of coaching availability? Okay. How far out in advance are we recruiting coaches and does, this, uh, does that start time need to be extended further to uh, find our coaches? Those conversations and advertisements are year round and vacancies are posted immediately and that's happening at the school level. So uh, Mr. Park and Mr. Laub is immediately upon knowing of a vacancy, they can go right into our frontline system which is um, the system that we use to post vacancies and they can get those uh, vacancies posted for us. And then we also added a note there, uh, Dr. Noonan and myself, we will for instructional vacancies. So that's our teachers, primarily our teachers, but oftentimes our teachers and paraprofessionals, um, school counselors, we will conduct a second interview kind of as a final interview prior to um, making that final request to hire to our human resources department. And we oftentimes ask, is coaching something you would be interested in, sponsoring a club? Because we want to attract folks who want to reach students outside of the classroom. And so a question around their interest in activities outside of the classroom is always something that, that we ask. That makes sense. In um, an effort to potentially fill coaching vacancies as well. That makes sense. And Mr. Park, um, <clears throat> the clearly hiring a, a new coach without any background or understanding takes a number of 
hours and steps and things like that versus um, having a parent that you know or that you have their credentials, um, getting a parent to do that. Um, in terms of your time and availability, is that an accurate statement? Is that uh, yeah, how much more time does it take to hire someone you don't know versus a parent? Um, in regards to the application process, uh, once applicants are submitted and apply on the frontline system, um, it's going through calling them, doing back uh, reference checks, uh, sending out those reference checks. I'm the one who usually has to submit those um, to those people that they put in the process. So it, just right off the bat, it takes time for me to be at the computer to do that um, and not on the field or not working in some other capacity. Uh, interviewing them, uh, phone calls, talking to uh, uh, if it's a head coach, uh, putting a panel together um, that consists of three to five people in the athletics department with the, along with the administration um, to have interviews depending on how many uh, applicants we have. Um, with a, a, an assistant position, um, we have to have the head coach get out of class or find time. So it is a, it, there is a time intensive process when we're hiring coaches that we have to, I have to get involved in on a, every time we hire somebody. Okay. Um, volunteers are a little bit easier uh, in regards. You still have to know their background. You still have to, have to do reference checks on them, but they're working in a different capacity as a as somebody who's volunteering along with a head coach or an assistant coach in the program. Um, so it's that's a little bit easier. But in regards to head coaches and assistant coaches, there's a time intensive process, the hiring process that we have to follow. Okay, and it does take time. How does how does that process change if it's a parent? Um, if it's a parent, they go through the hiring process. I still look at the same credentials. I'm looking at edu educators first. I want somebody who's a true educator at heart, um, whether they have uh, the <coughs> most experience playing Division One sports or they've just played high school sports. Um, I take that into consideration. But truly, I'm looking for somebody who's organized, who could communicate with the parents, who could uh, develop a rapport with the student athletes, who could fun teach fundamental basic skills, as well as allowing them to, to um, ensure that the students are there for academics first. So nothing's really different in the hiring process, whether it's a parent or, a, or a, uh, somebody um, who just has a passion for sports. Um, they still have to go through the same process. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Bethany? You mentioned volunteers, and I'm not familiar with the role of volunteers in the high school sports, so can you talk a little bit about the distinction and what sports have volunteers? And so um, a majority of our sports, like right now, our boys lacrosse program, uh, I, I'm trying to get two more volunteers. They have more, more players. Uh, they'll have 46 players possibly on the team. So uh, the coaching staff might not uh, – Will Stewart might not – be defense. I, I'm not. I don't know if he's defensive or offensive minded, but he might look for a mid a, somebody who could train the mids, uh, the middies, uh, or a goalies coach. I have another coach uh, who I'm putting through the process right now, who's who's applying to be a uh, goalies coach, and it's a volunteer, and it actually is a parent who's gone through that process. Um, uh, they have Division One experience, where Coach Partridge doesn't have Division One experience playing goalie. So bringing along that volunteer to work at practices on a part-time basis. It might be once a week. It could be three times a, uh, a, a, a week. Um, they usually aren't there at games, or they could be there at games for statisticians. It's whatever a volunteer can do to help better the program and help um, provide needs that the head coach feels is relevant. Um, we we could bring them along and allow them to work with the students. They still go through the same hiring process. They still have to do reference checks. They still have to apply on frontline. Um, they still have to talk to the head coach, find out what their roles and responsibilities are, and then I have to approve them uh, and put them through the, the the hiring process. A lot of those volunteers sometimes are parents. They are not paid. They do not provide any uh, 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 monetary uh, income from it. Um, it's just surely they have a passion that they want to allow their their the program to flourish and get better. Do you have a sense? I don't know, I'd imagine most of our parents, um, given the what they're doing. Do you have a sense for how many of them are volunteering with the, their own kid on the team as opposed to a sport that they're passionate about? Just a rough, you know, um, rough idea. Off the top of my head, we have six. 
we have six student, uh, six parents that are affiliated with the programs right now. Um, as a volunteer, we probably have, you know, Sean Coey, maybe one or two. Um, I have another parent who wants to volunteer for tennis. Uh, they went through the process right now. That was because we didn't have a tennis coach at the beginning of the season, and they were looking to uh, help assist um, another applicant we had who was going to be there, but the uh, one applicant couldn't do it. But that parent is still sitting there. They haven't contributed or helped out or they're helping the program out. That would be one, two. I think there's two possible volunteers off the top of my head I could think of right now that are parents that are in the program. One other one was a basketball, girls basketball. And when you say that our parents are in the program, you mean that are volunteering for a program in which they have a child? Yes, yes, okay, too. Thank you. Other questions or comments? Okay. Dr. Bates? All right, so our next question is about criteria that's used to hire coaches, and are there mandatory um, expertise or prior experience, and then what are the hard qualities? And so uh, for this one, I think it's, it's always a desire to bring in a, um, a coach who has experience, and whether it be played high school sports or, or played at a high-level division uh, or even professional, uh, but first and foremost, we, as you know, Mr. Park uh, alluded to, we want folks who have a genuine interest in coaching kids. They have a love for kids. They want to help um, students thrive outside of the classroom and and um, enjoy something that they're passionate about, but um, also um, help help students grow, but have a knowledge and a skill base. And so I can just um, share personally that um, I've seen coaches and, and worked alongside coaches who um, may have played at the high school level, but also played in the NFL as a former football, a varsity football coach. Just because you played a professional sport doesn't necessarily transfer to being an exceptional coach. And I think, uh, you know, sometimes when we go into the classroom and, and we, um, we see that sometimes a mathematician where mathematics just comes very easily and readily to them, it might not always transfer as naturally as we would like it to in providing instruction in a way that students can absorb it. And so, but we seek obviously to have coaches who have experience and have played the sport and know the sport, but most importantly, they have a passion for the sport and a passion for kids and, and helping kids thrive. Thank you. Questions or comments? Okay. Our next question asks about the total af um, athletic coaches, and we have 83. Straightforward. Stephanie. Yeah, so just so I'm clear, these 83 are the paid positions, not the volunteers that you just mentioned. Thanks. All right, and our next question is how many new coaches each year? And so including our head coaches and assistant coaches, and this is looking at last year, and I can have uh, Brian or, or Peter expand on this, but um, looking at last year, the turnover was around 30% of total coaching staff across all of the VHSL offered sports. So that means, Mr. Park, you're doing 20 plus interviews. Okay. To, brief, to fill those positions. Yes. <laughs> or more, more interviews than that. That's just for the finalists. But yeah. yeah. Okay. 20 plus positions. Okay. And do you have a sense of the breakdown? I don't know if there's any trends or anything of that turnover are you seeing more turnover in outside coaches staff coaches parent coaches is there any no we try to retain the coaches the best that we possibly can I, we always need help we always need coaches so that, what, having that uh, we have that volunteer tab open on the frontline system for always somebody to apply um, when that notification comes in it, it sends me alert that hey we have a volunteer um, who applied i have to go into the uh, online application and see what credentials they put down i then send it to the head coach and say hey somebody applied wants to be a volunteer do you know this person did you talk to this person who put in or is this just a outside person a community member who wants to has that desire to help out um but 
going on a on a turnover basis i i i don't have the exact numbers but it we we look at having as many people who could help out a program as we can the only thing i was going to add was that there was a question earlier about popularity of the sports um brian's not often interviewing for football or basketball coaches but field hockey tennis swim those things yes and and where you i mean we have vacancies right now on the website and we've had them all year um in five presently um and if you were to like depending on when you asked us to pull this data i'd bet there's at least five vacancies um of those 83 that we're trying to do and the popular sports are usually not where it's at so if i'm understanding correctly it sounds like the turnover if we're guessing why the turnover, right? So that's the mm -hmm. question. Is really like, is there anything that we can glean from your experiences about why there's turnover? Turnover in tennis happens because a lot of the tennis coaches will, uh, they are usually tennis pros, or they have an affiliation with a uh, cl local uh, club, and they are going to make more money uh, doing their private lessons than that we're going to be able to pay for the uh, for the duration of the three months. Um, if they break that down, that's uh, a lot where we see turnover swim same thing you have club swimmers um volleyball uh coach rastic's been there for three going on three years with me um or two years with me but i lose a lot of volleyball coaches because they're going to do club um soccer club soccer uh, it's it's generating um income for their families and they're going to make more money on their time if they do those type of things i do want to say thank you to this uh, board um, for increasing the salaries i do think that helped dramatically um, I, we are in the top three out of the when we did the compensation study where we looked at the five to six jurisdictions i think we're in the top three of those six jurisdictions uh, in pay in coaching pay um, and i do help, think that helps uh bring coaches and, and and have a desire for somebody to come to Falls Church City versus going to Fairfax um, or Loudoun or or Alexandria wherever it might be so coaching pay does have a, a, a lot of um, turnover rate also the distance we travel in games I have coaches uh, who were sitting on a bus for two hours uh, one way a lot of coaches it's just the wear and the tear and the grind and they have families, they have kids, they uh, um, start relationships, they have other desires, they're working on their education, their master's degree, uh, and those are all situations that, that usually come up to where um, it's not, uh, it, it's more beneficial to desire to do something else than to coach high school sports. So there's a lot of different factors why coaches coach, but off the top of my head, those are conversations I have with lots of them. That's really helpful. I appreciate that context. Um, it seems like there's a, at least in the independent coaches, meaning the not parents, not staff, um, that there's a higher turnover among them because they have other opportunities. There's an opportunity cost for them, mm -hmm. some of them. Yeah, and the timing of when we're getting out of school, we're getting out of school at 3 o'clock. So I, uh, 3 o'clock, we're on the practice fields at 3.30. There's a lot of parents who cannot make that demand of being at practice. So therefore, we look into, we look into schools, uh, our feeder programs uh, in the elementary schools. Uh, we look at alumni, college graduates, uh, somebody who's just starting to uh, try to get their foot on the door uh, in the door coaching um, but the start time also has a dramatic impact on who we hire and ha and and the ability of them to be on the bus at two o'clock for tennis matches um, it, it's it's hard to come by when somebody has a nine to five job one more question about this in the last question I mean with the last one of the last uh, things on this list um, is there a uh, Delta student ratio requirement by the HSL um, no, we don't. Uh, there, there's not. We look at them. We try with football. We have more football coaches because we have a, a team of 60. Um, usually try to do, or 60 to 70, you try to do 10 to 1 ratio with that sport. But there's not ratios that I have to, that I'm mandated that I have to have. What we did do with the compensation study, we try to make it equitable where we have a, a female head coach, a female assistant coach, a male head coach, and a male assistant coach for each sport. Um, based upon gender, we did look at that when we did the compensation study and how we allocated funding for each pro program for coaches. Thank you. Okay. All right. We'll look at the next question, which is how many coaches and what are the percentages over the past approximately three to five years have been parents versus teachers versus others 
And so we provided you with a 2324 snapshot, which includes our coaching slots again, which is 83. The percentage for the FCCPS staff as coaches is 29%. Parent, parents as coaches, it's 12%. And we have a total of 853 students in sports. Is that a total number of students that, that could be a duplicate student taking multiple sports? sports? Yes. OK. okay. Yeah, I, I, I broke down the data um, a little bit further. If we look at fall athletes, we have 298 fall athletes. Because uh, I broke it down further because I, I, I always look at that, too. We have duplicate athletes participating. In the fall, 298 athletes. Uh, winter, 252 athletes. And spring, 303 athletes. So it's roughly um, a third, yeah, 30 to 32 percent uh, on average every season uh, individually are participating in sports. Okay. Thank you. Lori? Thank you. Um, is there a minimum threshold of participation that we need? There's no minimum uh, threshold. There is a minimum threshold to field the team. If I didn't have nine softball uh, JV players, I would not be able to field the team. There's numerous schools out there that we don't have, uh, that don't field teams. So I have to then try to find alternative schools to play. Um, other things that we do, last night we played Riverside High School and Girls Lacrosse. They did not have enough uh, players to field the JV Girls Lacrosse program. So we offered to play 7v7 to allow our student athletes to participate with them. So there's no threshold, but there is a minimum threshold to participate in a VHSL event. So like Girls Golf has won. How does yeah. that operate? So um, our girls' uh, female golfer is able to go participate since it's an individual sport. She can enter in tournaments and participate in tournaments. She did advance the regionals, uh, a regional qualifier, based upon her score that she shot in the regular season. I have to ensure that she gets into matches to shoot that uh, round so she can qualify. If I didn't um, uh, allocate funds for her to get into certain tournaments she would not be able to qualify for the postseason play so we can go with one athlete uh, one of my desires uh, starting the girls golf program was to continue to enhance it and build a program to where we're competing with Langley where they have uh, 10, 10 female athletes sure. on the program and and then looking at that you know there's one unfilled assistant coach but I would argue maybe not needed if we have a head coach and it's one-to-one -one ratio you can look at it, yes. Yep. Okay. Other questions on the chart or this answer? All right. Requirements and expectations for coaches, Dr. Bates? Well, yeah, so uh, the VHSL does require um, the following courses and training for all high school uh, coaches for VHSL sanctioned sports, and we listed those. Um, courses there and it includes everything from principles of coaching to um, child abuse and neglect recognition to CPR and AED training um, also concussion trainings and, and understanding the protocols for concussions but we have that list there for you thank you questions on the courses Bethany can you uh, give a little insight into what's in the principles of coaching course? The rest of the things seem, and what's in the VHSL state component, the other things uh, seem preventative uh, as opposed to proactive, which is important. We should have the preventative, but I'm curious if there's any, what proactive is in. Uh, so the principles yeah. of coaching course is just a general coaching guidelines talking about how to talk to parents, communicate with parents, communicate with uh, student athletes, um, uh, practice planning developing um, uh, uh, out goals, goal setting, uh, X's and O's, uh, preparations, um, be pre-game procedures, post-game procedures, supervision. Um, that is the principles of coaching course that's offered by the VHSL. Um, that's a course that you have to do one time in your career. Um, I did it back in 2003. That stays with you for the duration of your VHSL career. Uh, the other one you asked about was the local VHSL state component that's also affiliated with that same program through the VHSL, through the NFHS, or the 3D Institute of the Human Kinetics. So it's a program that costs about $35 to $50, depending on what it is. Um, 
it's just it goes more into the VHSL rules and regulations and guidelines and procedures that we have to abide by here in the state of Virginia that they have to go through. But again, those two, number one and three, are a one-time uh, coaching career that they'd have to get done. So a new coach coming to us, if they can show that they've already been through that, they don't need They to do not have again. to do that again. And it sounds like none of these requirements of VHSL uh, have anything to do with youth development or actually understanding kind of the kids. It seems like it's more administerial and preventive. It's the development of kids. They're not, no, it's not education-based, but for as a, somebody would be certified as a teacher or in that means. But it, there is, there are being trained on how to, how to formulate practice plans, units, but not, they do talk about mental health and mental wellness and certain things and social um, well-being of students that's talked about in them, but it's not, again, it's not focused on just education. Do, I know it's hard enough to get coaches, so the answer is may well be no, but um, f for the coaches, I'm not this description, for the coaches that are not teachers or the teams that don't have a teacher on the coaching staff, right? So that teacher has been through a variety of youth development education. Um, what, if any, supports or things are we as a district doing or able to do for them to sort of backfill that? So you know, that knowledge on, the on top of that, on, on top of these credentials, there is also safe school training. It's a four-hour course that all paid staff, all those 83 coaches have to go through, um, through um, it's safe schools and it's, it's videos, educational videos that are more uh, uh, based towards education and what we do here in the Falls Church City Public Schools. Um, I also allow coaches to get professional development. There are some coaches who take advantage of that. Um, if they're not knowledgeable, let's say field hockey, uh, Coach Steinhook this year uh, attended a, a conference to better her uh, understanding of, of creating a relationship with students and getting more educated on field hockey. Uh, they always have that ability. Our football program, they join clinics um, and seminars with P.J. Anderson, and he, he buys the clinic for the entire staff to become developed on whatever the skills and techniques are that he wants. But there's that, and then a lot of it, a lot of coaches come to me and ask questions on, hey, based upon your experience, what do I need to do, or how can I handle this situation? Um, we have a coaching handbook that they all read. It's about 32 pages that they have to understand, and they got to see what what um, resources are out there for them. But the one of the best resources we have is the NFHS network. There's a lot of free courses that I push uh, the coaches to. One of my goals in the future is to have coaches to get their certification uh, through the NFHS. There's certain levels. There's level one, level two, um, and those are other directions that I push them if they're struggling or if I think they need some more resources to allow them to better communicate with parents or whatever it might be. Yeah, I, I would also offer, um, having sat in uh, – a number of, of interviews of coaches, assistants, and um, head coaches. One of the things we always ask above and beyond your experience with the sport, what is your experience working with children? What is your experience working with kids? Um, and especially for those who are not teachers or who are not in education, oftentimes when, um, well, actually not oftentimes, all but I can't think of a time when I've ever reviewed a resume for a prospective coach and it wasn't full of experiences where they've worked with kids, whether it was youth sports or whether it was camps, um, and they may be accountants or they may be, you know, attorneys, but um, through their church groups um, or just personally, they've had a wide ar array of engagements with working with youth and, and, and working with kids, and so those are things that we look at as well. All right. It looks like the next two questions, Dr. Bates, are somewhat related. It's the how coach requirements expectations are enforced. Yep. So those are <clears throat> they're sanctioned by uh, the VHSL, and as uh, Mr. Park had mentioned, that in order to be uh, certified or, or eligible to coach a VHSL sanctioned sport, you have to go through these these courses, the, the various courses, and that's monitored by our director of student activities or athletic director. Okay, thank you. Questions about or comments about that? 
And then the next question, uh, what variations by sport are there for the above questions, which was none. Any questions about that? Comments? All right. And we're going to nepotism. Yes, yeah, safeguards to prevent um, nepotism, good or bad, uh, between the coach and uh, the player. So we, as we've stated before, we don't have any written policies or regulations on nepotism in coaching, um, but we do have our handbook that um, talks about our code of ethics and code of conduct. And um, as you can see there, whether it's modeling fair play or sportsmanship, um, <clears throat> consistency, uh, requiring uh, all players to adhere to established rules. We're, we would never expect our coaches to not adhere to what we're expecting our, of our student athletes. And so those are things that we have in the, in the uh, handbook. Uh, also, we, we have to rely on a professionalism, as we stated there, professionalism of the folks that we're bringing in to work with with our students and that they are ensuring fairness and equity in the decisions that they're making and that they're, uh, there's never any mistreatment of students. And so that's something that, again, it's not just expected, but we also monitor and we respond to if ever anything would, would come our way to, um, to alert us of a concern. And um, Again, the oversight is going to be at the school level with our athletic director or director of student activities. Great. Lori or Amy? Uh, thank you. I, I, I'm wondering, um, it says here that when there is an issue or a suspected issue that that would be followed up with potentially an, an investigation. And so I'm wondering if you could give a snapshot of what that would look like just from start to finish, say you got a complaint that about a particular coach on a particular team. Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and start it. And then, you know, Brian or Peter, y'all can, y'all can fill in. So I, I think with, just like with anything, we're, we're going to, to, to sit and listen to what exactly the concern is. And then from there, we're going to launch the investigation. So that's meeting with the, the coach. It's also meeting with assistant coaches and it's meeting with players to get a better understanding of uh, what the, what the concern is. If it's around, um, unfair and or unequitable practices, then we may, um, look at the co or ask the coach to present us with rubrics and um, criteria to help determine what is, what, what is kind of the standard, let's say if we're talking basketball, what is kind of the standard that you would have for a student or two or three students that you're trying to make a decision on who's going to be the starting point guard or who's going to be the starting power forward or, or, or center? And what are some of the things that you're looking for? And then how will the student, how is that being communicated to the player or the student? And then how, um, how are you giving them guidance and direction on how they can get better um, and improve? And how are the decisions you're making aligning to with what you're communicating to the student athlete or what the student athlete um, is expecting? Because where we um, find that we run, in, run into trouble is where there's a misalignment of ex expectations or criteria and then the decisions that are being made. And it, it could be it. So with, with sports, it can get a little tricky because we've seen, you know, situations and I've even experienced on both ends as a coach or as, as a um, player where you, for, for instance, have like a first team. And so you might be with the f practicing for three days in a row or four days in a row with the first team um, soccer, you know, soccer team. And the day or two before the game as the coaches are reviewing film and they're looking strategically at who's the you know, who who's the best forward who's the best mid person so on or so forth there might be a better matchup that somebody who didn't spend the that week practicing with the first team and maybe y'all are kind of close in your skill set and so um prior to the game they say you know well amy you're going to come in off of the bench and we're going to have Kathleen be the, the, you know, first team. And so that's where sometimes I think it gets a little challenging, but we have to trust our coaches 
that they're making the right decisions and they're making informed decisions and they're they're collaborating and again putting um, in their eyes the the players that they've monitored, watched, and given feedback to, um, putting that, that those players are putting the team in the best position to be competitive. We we had a circumstance recently, and I'm hoping that Mr. Park at a kind of high level <coughs> can talk about how that one was dealt with as well. Um, so when there's uh, when there's issues that arise with playing time or or treatment, every case is unique and, and situational based upon whatever is brought to our attention. Um, and then when something in regards to procedures aren't being followed or the uh, professionalism of of putting a player in a starting lineup or or rubrics or or assessments aren't being looked at appropriately. That's where I have to come in and, and provide guidance or look at the situation and come to a decision on what is the best best uh, process moving forward, um, whether that's uh, educating the coaching staff with, uh, with other types of material, uh, providing them guidance with mentors um, uh, who know specific sports, uh, as well as me uh, supervising practices and watching them and giving feedback on a daily basis just like an administrator would in a, a, a classroom. Those are all things that are taken in consideration on how we handle each situation. But every situation is unique. A lot of the situations come around playing time, um, and that's where we do put in a lot of trust and, and professionalism and belief in what the coach is doing. But when situations arise, they're brought to our attention, and then we do have to look into each one and come to a conclusion what is best for the individual uh, student athlete as well as what's best for the team, uh, depending on whatever the goals are that are out there. Can I ask a follow up on that. Um, I'm wondering where, when, when concerns are raised, where do they usually come from? Do they come from parents or do they come from the kids? And if it, and I'm sorry, I just wanted to get my follow-up out there so you understand where I'm going with this. Um, I'm wondering what mechanisms there are in place to ensure that a kid who feels they're treated unfairly um, won't fear that they're going to be, I don't want to say retaliated, it's, not, it's like such a loaded word, but that they won't, because, because playing time is a sensitive issue for kids. And they're afraid that if they say something you know, they're they're going to end up just sitting on the bench, you know, because it may not come out in their favor. So I, I've been doing this for 22 years. I was a varsity girls lacrosse coach and a varsity uh, girls basketball coach as well as boys JV basketball coach uh, and freshman coach as well um, at multiple schools. And creating a relationship with the student athletes is something that we tried to uh, – push upon and educate the coaches with through the trainings and through discussions and talks that that they are there to provide an educational uh, uh, service to that student athlete um, and that they have to create a community uh, a bond and a relationship with that student athlete that allows the student athlete to be able to talk and have a conversation about where they stand um, we have coaches meetings in the beginning of the season where the coaches talk to the families um, at the parent meetings uh, on a uh, seasonal basis so they could talk up front of what the expectations are, um, what their goals are. Um, we have uh, pamphlets on our athletic website for parent uh, 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 coach communications, but a lot of it has to deal with the, the, the student athlete talking to the coach and, and being able to talk about uh, the issues that are at hand. The retaliation, why I said I've coached before those multiple sports, it's the coaches are putting the best players in the situations like uh, uh, Dr. Bates said earlier, um, where we feel is going to be the most beneficial or successful for the team uh, at any given time or whatever the sport might be. But the uh, retaliation, as you call it, um, that is something that has gone on in my career for 22 years, but we, we rely on talking to the professionalism of the coach and, and the honesty of the coach that they're doing what is the best for those children at that given time or that student athlete or the team. And then if, if we see something that isn't aligning with our goals or our, our, uh, our, our principles um, 
that we set forth in our athletic handbooks and our mission, then it's something that we have to look at and talk to the coach and have a corrective course of action and maybe put them on an action plan or her on an action plan to improve upon for the next school year. David, did you have a question? Yeah, I have a follow-up question, Mr. Park. <coughs> um, yeah, uh, some of the discussion or some of the impetus for the, this discussion on parents as coaches has to do with um, perceptions of unfair treatment regarding playing time, which is obviously, as we've been discussing, a sensitive subject. Um, what I'm hearing is that this is a common issue across all of the sports. How common are kind of, I wouldn't say complaints, but like concerns raised to you regarding pay, playing time generally? Uh, seasonally? Um say maybe five five I've had to deal with this year uh, with playing time and I have to work and and communicate with the coaches and talk to the coaches hey here's the standpoint or the or the um, belief of what's happening um, can you tell me your side and, and and educate me on what's happening are you communicating your goals are you communicating with the parents are you communicating with the student athlete about where they stand or what the true realistic uh, evaluation or assessment of their skill sets are um, are you rotating people in um, are you getting them playing time on the JV if they're not playing on the varsity are you putting them in the right situation so I would say I've dealt with five this year uh, and I'm in the spring season right now about um, playing times or issues or where we were putting them so it's not so so much I have 18 varsity sports uh, 19 hopefully next year with boys volleyball so that that's where we're at where okay. it's unique and out of that that's out of 800 or 600 some athletes okay very good i know i appreciate that so it's you know not yeah not rare but not not a significant no it doesn't take up a huge chunk of my time as <coughs> much as where yeah <laughs> recruiting okay. coaches and trying to get coaches hired okay uh, and then it doesn't seem as if just based on the numbers then that would that it would be unique then to a parent coach necessarily no it's over 22 years i've had to deal with it at least five times a year like i'm saying thank you other questions before we get to the last question which i'm going to replace okay the last question is just pretty straightforward it says what are the restrictions uh possibility and it, it's clear the answer is pretty clear um a quick question to replace that though is uh for going back to bethany's question about in, uh, volunteers are volunteers covered under the FCCPS insurance policy? If there isn't, uh, like a, a volunteer was pitching at baseball and, and heard a, a state they, they are approved. They are approved through the the um, the hiring process, and they are looked at as a, a coach. Um, they are. They also have different stipulations. They are not provided email addresses because they're not communicating with the the, the student athletes as a head coach or a, a assistant coach who is paid. Um, we leave those communications up to the head coach and the assistant coach. They also um, have to be monitored by a paid and supervised coach uh, while they're engaged with students, so they're not there alone. So. Okay. For insurance purposes, I I would have to leave that up, but they go through the whole process of of hiring just like anybody else. Okay, thank you. I believe they are covered by our insurance, and they are um, considered our employee for those purposes, even though they are unpaid. Okay, okay, great. Okay, um, that concludes the written questions. I think there was an additional question that Amy had about just uh, other any other data. Correct, Amy, that you asked about uh, just a, a couple years back that Brian or Mr. Park you might have. Um, it'd be great if you could provide that in the next time that would be available. Um, I, before we get to our general discussion about this, which I do want to open up to the board, um, I clearly appreciate Mr. Park, Mr. Laub, uh, Dr. Bates, everyone who is involved with the, the, the putting this together. I imagine there's a lot more names than that. So we really appreciate the time on this. I think this is, a um, an important question for us to, to wrestle with, no pun intended, um, and we look forward to trying to figure out where we're going to move next. So um, before we open up to the board for a general conversation about this, any questions or Dr. Noonan, any, Mr. Dr. Bates? Okay. Okay. So our next steps on this, we're thinking about uh, uh, drafting a possible policy, but I do want to get a pulse check on the board, and I know that a number of emails are coming in. I think the athletic boosters uh, mentioned that they're going to be sending a letter in 
Um, they mentioned that to us today that's going to be coming soon. They discussed this. Um, so we're still going to gather some more community feedback. Um, so I'm not looking for anyone on the board now to commit to whether we're looking forward to moving forward on a policy or regulation or just exploring the issue. But I do want to have with Mr. Park here, Mr. Laub, and just a general board discussion. Does anybody have any thoughts, initial thoughts about where they're thinking on this? Jared? So I don't really have an initial position, but just kind of thinking about uh, Mr. Park's answers, thinking about the need for policy. We would also want to think about whether or not the kind of uh, effects on students are differential if the parent is a coach versus somebody else is a coach. If it's the case that these things arise at equal rates with paid coaches who are not parents versus those coaches who are our parents, I'm not quite sure if we that that would not say to me that we need a particular policy about parents. Um, now, whether or not that's necessarily the case, I don't know. But presumably, we'd want to know kind of whether these issues arise more if parents are coaches versus not. I think, in theory, that that is interesting data to have. The problem is, and. You know, I just know that if my kids were playing a sport um, and I and my child and myself are, did not think that they were getting adequate playing time, I think the last thing that we would do is call the coach and complain. Um, I think that my kids would probably disown me if I did that. And so we might not have a good, accurate reading on whether it happens more with parent coaches, whether it happens more with non-parent coaches, whether, for example, that five complaints that you get throughout the year is the actual real number of people feeling this way or not. Um, I just think that that's kind of a hard gauge, is my opinion, if that makes sense. We're just going to open up general discussion, so no need to be called on if anyone wants to jump in with where they're at, thoughts, just general thoughts as well. Sure. I, um, g going back to a point we were talking about earlier, which is uh, retention. And I'm wondering if, you know, just something to think about, I wonder how often parents continue to coach after their, if they have a kid on the team, after their kid graduates. Um, simply, you know, so I'm, I'm just thinking if you're looking for longevity, I wouldn't place my money on a parent who has a kid on the team simply because part of their motivation must be to spend more time with their child. I, I, I would... You know, I would enjoy that like any parent. Um, and that, so that's just a thought about retention. Ms. Minson, um, from a liability perspective, and not to put you on the spot, but do you have any general thoughts about the liability of, uh, to Jared's point, about a parent as a coach versus a, a, a non-parent as a coach? Is there any difference from a legal perspective? I don't really think so as long as they've gone through the training, we've done the fingerprinting, we make sure that um, there's checks in place that if they have questions about how to coach, how to do rubrics, how to give feedback, that's been provided. Okay. I, I don't think that there would be more or less liability if there's a parent versus a non-parent. Okay, thank you. Uh, one other thing that has come up in discussion is uh, privacy issues. And so I'm wondering, and I, you know, I don't, I would think that this would be relevant information to know what specifically, what information uh, or private information about students do, do coaches get? Do they get information about, for instance, disciplinary, disciplinary actions that have been taken, medications, health conditions? The coach, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say that at, as an employee of FCCPS, so that for starters, like they would absolutely get certain demographic information that is necessary for any employee working with kids um, in the same way that if that, uh, if a parent was a substitute teacher and working on a field trip or something, they would absolutely like on a need to know basis have access to that information. Um, but that is only for those purposes, right? And so I think any use of that information for nefarious needs would violate our employment contract, but I'll let Ms. <laughs> Minson's nodding her head. But I would assume that using it for any purposes other than necessary to coach would be out of bounds. 
And that's right. And we do require all of our coaches to do um, the training on safe schools, as Mr. Park mentioned. That does include the legal training, and that does include training that I provide on FERPA. Just to clarify, so does that include disciplinary information? Like if a, if a child was... It, it, it could. Okay. Sorry. No, it, no, it could. I, if there were a disciplinary circumstance that would preclude a student from playing in a game because they violated the, um, you know, the athletic um, contract, absolutely the coach would know that. And you, you also could have a situation, um, hopefully rare, but if a student is, if a student is, um, for instance, suspended out of school, then they're not eligible to compete on the days that they're, whether they're suspended or unexcused absent. They're, and so I've, you know, that would need to be communicated to the coach. Um, I've, I've seen many situations where not getting into the nitty gritty of a student's discipline, but coaches are relied, pretty heavily relied upon to help oftentimes keep students on a straight and narrow who may be struggling uh, behaviorally. And um, unfortunately, we've had cases where if uh, we, you have a student athlete during the football season or the basketball season, they're kind of that straight arrow. And then when they're out of season, they really struggle because whether it's the lack of structure or the lack of having um, – that coach in their life just to kind of make sure that hey if you're not if if you're you're not doing well academically then you may not be eligible to play if you're not doing well behaviorally and you get in trouble then you may not be able to practice which means you may not be able to play and so oftentimes you know we're not necessarily handing over a discipline report to the coach but we're expecting our teachers and our administrators to have those conversations with the with those student athletes and there's also an expectation that as you're stepping onto the field or as you're stepping onto the bus and going to another jurisdiction you're and you have that m or that mustang on your chest you're representing not just that school but this entire school community so there's expectations for how you should conduct yourself as a young man or young woman and so um behavioral expectations are we ex expect and need our coaches to help support with that and if I may just clarify I think that's one of the best things about kids being involved in athletics is co coaches can serve as role models um, they can reinforce you know as you pointed out you can't play if you got suspended um, I've heard I, d I don't know whether or not this is true but I've heard that you know if kids get caught with dr drugs or alcohol outside of school that sometimes they can lose playing time all of those things are are I think great advantages to our athletic program and that's why I'm concerned about having people in those positions where they have the opportunity to know about things that may blend into a child's personal life in those in those positions somebody who may also have a personal relationship with that coach or their parents may have a personal relationship with that coach I mean I'm sure that happens in that can happen in any case. I mean, we can you know be friends with teachers and other employees, um, but I can imagine that it has the potential to be um, more of a problem if a parent is a coach. At least that's the way I see it. I think the other concern, and, and welcome your thoughts on this, Mr. Park, is the uh, concept that parents would provide preferential treatment um, for playing time. I mean, you know, there's obviously different aspects of why this policy would be of interest for us. Um, in your experience, what do you feel like would be best to try to address that concern? And we've heard from members of the community that has happened. I mean, that's, I know that's part of, 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 of athletics. Um, how do you feel like, what advice would you have for us to try to somehow address that? And I think that the reason why I ask that is I, I know that other surrounding districts do not have a policy on parent coaching and I appreciate you figuring that out for us the uniqueness about Falls Church City is we are a small community and I think we tend to be a bit more insular with our recruitment for coaches and so I think we were faced with this experience of parents being put in position of coaching perhaps more so than other districts because we we are a bit more insular and I, I don't have any data to back that up but I'm just gonna 
act like it's true. So do you have any advice or thoughts on, or, on how we can address that parent relationship with preferential treatment to their child um, for playing time or selection on teams? If the parent was coaching, you're saying. If Correct. A, if a parent or is a, assistant a coach, coaching or an assistant yeah. coach. How do we it, address that? It's training. It, it's 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 educating them on doing what is in the best interest of the of the team and that student athlete in each unique circumstance. I think again believing in the professionalism that we have a true educator at heart leading the team or assisting the team and putting the kids best interests forward is is what we talk about with the head coaches and assistant coaches. Um, I, I really in regards to having a policy being at Prince William County Schools for six years as a D, at DSA, we had coaches uh, and parents coach there, and I I didn't run into situations where we had to have certain policies or procedures set forth for um for for regulating who can coach and who can't coach. We are a small small district here, uh, Prince William. It was uh, way bigger. I just. I don't see the need for a policy um, in regards to having parents um, parents not being able to coach. As as I'm I'm looking for everybody who who wants to contribute to the to Meridian High School our athletic program or our, our activities program. Um, without parents being able to contribute um, and help out, it, it's hard it's hard to come by with coaches and and support staff to manage. 850 students, 19 programs with uh, additional JV programs. So I think we work together, and I work, oh, the administration, myself, um, we work and educate the parents just like we do um, any other outside applicant who does not have a family member in the school system, and and we educate them the best that we can to to do what's right for each program. Mm -hmm. um, and then if a cir circumstances does come up, we have to deal with that circumstance and we have to work through the the issues and the problems to try to 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 come to a resolution or a, an agreement that puts forth the best course of action that makes sense and i and it's not a perfect analogy but i know at least my teaching days teachers would not teach their students you know they would always be placed in different classes and i again it's not a perfect analogy but um I think what we're faced with is a reality that happens is where that isn't the case. It's actually the opposite, that we have coaches that are with their kids. Um, and how do, we, how do we differentiate our training for a parent that is a coach versus uh, a staff member that doesn't have any kids? And it does seem like that would be necess necessitate different kind of coaching if a parent does have a child on that team or even an assistant coach, correct? It, it, more of a head coach role, an assistant coach role has provides feedback and guidance and information and assessments on the skill abilities of whatever the sport might be. But I, I think the head coach is the one who is more responsible for putting together that lineup of that football team or the basketball program or whatever sure. it might be. Um, I again, we we try to educate our coaches the same way. We don't look at a parent any different than I would as a as a. a some other applicant who would put in who doesn't have a student um, in the program. Um, I think by keep being consistent with that course, we educate them to be good coaches and productive educators. Um, and and there's no differentiation on how we train them or how they should handle each situation. So even if they're a parent of a player on that team, you're saying there's no need to differentiate the training if they're a parent coach versus – because we, we go over the communication, you go over how to communicate, how to provide uh, uh, feedback, how to assess. I think I think the conversations I've had in the past, I, I'll give you an example. Mickey Thompson over at Stonebridge High School was a football coach for 30 years. He coached his sons um, in football, and he didn't treat them any differently. Um, and that's a, maybe a unique circumstance, but that's how I would look at coaches where – uh, Jess Hollinger is a track and field cross country coach for us right now. Her son just went through the program um, and he's going to be graduating. She's not going to treat him any differently than she would another athlete. So where I'm saying there's no differentiation of how we train the coaches to to talk and educate their, their particular team, it, it's uniform across the board. 
um, because they they have to be trained the same way. If I hold them a, accountable in a different way, I feel I feel that's then then opening up doors to have them treat somebody different, possibly where I rather just train them all accordingly based upon the guidance and procedures that we have here in Falls Church City Public Schools and hold them accountable to those one set of standards. I just want to emphasize that I think that a couple of people have brought up professionalism here this evening and I think that's the word that you, you asked if there's any advice from us over here and I think my advice would be lean on the professionalism of the folks that we hire and if there's not um, these, as these things do come up, as Brian's saying, right, and, they, and I recognize that this does happen, we have to have strong training for all coaches. We have to have strong accountability measures for coaches and for student athletes that are uniform across the board. You know, uh, you referenced that Falls Church is a little different, a little insular, right? Like, we're all neighbors and know each other here in this city, um, and it works the schools mirror that in some ways right and I think that we lean on the professionalism of all of us in this room and know that like what we're doing here um, we're wearing our professional hats and doing it well and I think that um, we can do the same for our coaching for our athletics program thank you appreciate it any other comments or questions for mr. Park mr. Lau while we have them not so much a, a question for them um, so it strikes me that we have a challenge recruiting enough coaches anyway, period. Now that's a problem. We don't want to make that harder. That's a detriment to the students. Right? We won't be able to offer the programs. Um, it strikes me that we have a subset of independent coaches who are presumably have some expertise in the sport. I don't know why they would be coaching otherwise, right? I mean, this is, this is not, not the easiest job. It's not the greatest hour, so they're typically people. And I used to for your context, I ran a youth sports organization for a number of years, so I have some context for this. Um, so presumably most of those independent coaches are, have some sports training and you know, are versed in this space, and those are also the hard ones to retain because they have other opportunities that come up. Um, and it strikes me that even in professional environments, there are waiver, conflicts of interest waivers or conflict of interest policies, I should say, that folks have to abide by. And I certainly in my field, there are conflict of interest policies folks have to assign and, and step back and they're at least from the community input we're getting, does seem to be the perception, not that any coach, any coach, no matter who they are, what relationship they have, could play favorites or not play favorites. So that's irrespective of whether they have a kid on the team. But there certainly seems to be a perception, uh, at least has been communicated to us this way, that parent coaches are doing this in a way that is detrimental to other kids on the team. And um, as I don't know if those parent coaches collectively are ones with the professional expertise, like the gentleman who we were talking about in your past school district who coached for 30 years, or if they're popping in for the three years because they have some connection to the sport or five years, whatever it is, and have a kid on the team. And it, so I'd be concerned about a policy that makes it harder for us to get coaches. And I'd also think there's value in having it be really clear, whether it's the equivalent of the nepotism policy, um, you know, very clear that if there is the imprimatur of a conflict, that that's something that needs to be dealt with. Um, because that also sabotages sports programs. Thank you. So it seems like, and Dr. Nader, looking to you here, it seems like we've got a few options. One, uh, I think we were planning on having a first reading at next meeting, but it might be something where um, Kathleen and I connect with the board individually and figure out where folks are at and kind of just get take a pulse check over the next week. Um, and then we'll get back to you on okay. on where we're at. So that makes uh, sense. Does that sounds good for everybody on this table? Okay. All right. Okay. Well, listen, Mr. Park, Mr. Lau, appreciate you staying late. Um, I know this is a rarity for you to stay late after school. So, um, uh, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> no, we appreciate the time, and we appreciate everybody who put all their uh, time and attention to the answers. I know there was a significant amount of thought and data that was provided, and obviously to Mr. Lau, to your point, a lot of um, expertise that was that was uh, shared tonight. So we appreciate you guys taking time and walking us through this. Thank you very much. So, thank. You. All right, uh, Dr. Noonan, we're going to go to section okay. three, upcoming items. Great. Um, just to preview a few things that are coming up on April 9th at the uh, regular meeting, um, we will have the and Mr. Park will be back. We'll have the recognition of the winter sports athletes, uh, which will be a lot of fun, including a, 
our girls basketball team, I hope, and some of our swim and dive folks that did really well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we'll be recognizing Alex Way, uh, our dive champ, state champion um, yep. in Class 3, as well as the girls basketball team um, and possibly a boys basketball team member. That's great. Uh, we'll also be recognizing Odyssey of the Mind and the Scholastics Bowl team. Um, there will be the approval of our special education plan that Rebecca Sharp and um, the special ed advisory has been working on, um, the VSBA honor roll. And this is the night that we recognize uh, VSBA honor roll um, nominees. They will not be joining us that night, but it's the night that we'll recognize them. And then we'll invite them back, assuming that they win the VSBA honor roll award. Um, we'll do a, a brief budget update, um, and then we'll wait to hear back from you all about kind of how you'd like to proceed with this um, this work tonight. On the April 23rd work session, um, we will have a work session on elementary classroom placements. Um, Rebecca Sharp will be here talking about special education and special services as an overview, along with um, uh, other members of the team. And then um, we'll have a work session on policies, uh, specifically how, to, how this board would like to approach policies uh, and the current committee structure that uh, Tricia has been working on with Amy and Bethany. So it's an opportunity to sort of pick up on the conversation that was raised at the dais at the last meeting. And then we'll end with a quarterly budget report. So those are the things that are coming up in the next month. Um, and we'll be work continuing to work on those to make sure that um, they're successful for you all. Great. Thank you, Dr. Noonan. All right. Well, with all that, uh, we'll move to Section 4 and meetings adjourned. Thank you.